Good morning and welcome to this three-day virtual conference on engineered bamboo for sustainable construction. My name is Ian De La Rush, and I'm one of the moderators for today's session. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our conference co-chairs, uh, Suzanne Lucas, who is the executive director of the World Bamboo Organization, and Professor Chumping Dai uh, from the University of British Columbia, and the leader of the Bamboo Application and Manufacturing Laboratory uh, in the Department of Wood Science. Suzanne will now say a few words of welcome and officially open this conference. Suzanne, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. It's my honor and privilege to welcome you all today. Um, and on behalf of the World Bamboo Organization, I'm happy to see you here. Uh, we're very grateful to the University of British Columbia for hosting this event. Building with bamboo is ages old and continues to evolve. We've witnessed the contemporary expansion of whole comb constructions, thanks to great masters like Simone Velez of Colombia, Elora Hardy of Bali, and Voi Trung Nia of Vietnam. These constructions are truly remarkable and very inspirational. However, I saw my first engineered uh, bamboo example about 30 years ago when Charlie Young brought the first container of engineered bamboo products to Europe. And today I believe that bamboo can bring a paradigm shift to sustainable development as an engineered product one that can be standardized, mass replicated, and publicly ac accepted across the globe, both in temperate and in tropical climates. The stigma of bamboo as a poor man's timber is immediately lost in its engineered state, just as it is in the fantasy housing for the rich in the tropical climates. In North America and in Europe, and many other places around the world, engineered bamboo is a sustainable solution as a building material. It's a durable good that stores carbon. As a perennial woody grass, it can be harvested for decades without replanting. It can be grown on degraded lands. Its carbon cycling is unparalleled and its cultivation and utility can alleviate poverty and improve royal local economies. To change mindsets and promote this improved way to build, we need true collaboration and dedicated partners. And this is why I sought the support of the UBC Forestry Department to see this important conference become a reality. Thank you to John Innes, Chung Ping Dai, Ian, and the whole team uh, for having the confidence that we can do this together. Thanks to our advisory committee and many thanks to all of our sponsors for this timely opportunity to reveal the possibilities of engineered bamboo and how its role in a more sustainable future. We simply must build more responsibly and bamboo can help enormously. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. And now I'll turn to Chung Ping who will say a few words. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Suzanne. First of all, Suzanne, thank you for approaching us about uh, uh, six months ago uh, for organizing this conference. It's been a great journey so far. Um, and I'd also like to thank our partner, uh, Zhejiang Agriculture and Forest University uh, for collaborating and the support for uh, organizing this conference as well. And, and, and most importantly, I want to thank uh, all the, uh, um, the, the speakers and, and uh, that uh, put in your effort to, uh, to join this meeting and, uh, and uh, make the uh, conference uh, possible because of your uh, caliber of um, speaker and, and, and we have a lot of uh, attendees and, and, and people that uh, registered for this event. And I know some of people are still signed in, but um, I'd like to share the screen just to show you how uh, uh, overwhelming response we've got so far uh, for this conference. Um, you see the screen here? Okay. So, so we have received uh, over 800 um, people uh, to uh, join this uh, conference. And, uh, and, and here are the top countries. And uh, 
And uh, we also have over 84 countries and delegates that uh, uh, sign up for this. And so we're extremely excited to have you join us. And uh, like you, I'm also very much looking forward to the, uh, the conference in the next uh, uh, two or three days. And thank you very much. Thank you, Champagne. Uh, and now uh, we'll turn to today's session on products and applications. We have a great day ahead of us and uh, with seven renowned speakers who will be sharing their expertise and extensive experiences working with engineered bamboo and sustainable uh, construction, sustainable construction. And I, I now have the pleasure uh, to, of introducing my co-chair for this session, uh, Ms. Uh, Kawei uh, Liu, who is the coordinator for for the Global uh, Bamboo Construction Program at INBAR. Uh, Kuwait. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Yi. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the International Bamboo and Return Organization, we are very happy to support this kind of the event led by UBC. So it's also my great pleasure to co-chair this session with Professor Yi. So let's welcome the first speaker, Professor Michael Ramage from the Cambridge University of the UK. Before his presentation, I will um, introduce him um, briefly. Professor Michael Ramage leads the Center for Natural Material Innovation at Cambridge University. And he is Professor of Architecture and Engineering in the Department of Architecture and a Fellow of Sydney Sussex College a chartered member of the Institution of Structural Engineers and a founding partner of Light Earth Designs. He studies geonology and archaeology and an undergraduate followed by architecture and MIT. And he worked for Cosit Bronzani in Switzerland prior to teaching and getting a PhD at Cambridge. His research is focused on developing low energy structural materials and systems in masonry, better housing in the developing world and large scale high rise buildings in engineered timber and bamboo through natural material innovation. He teaches, researches and designs buildings and receives research funding from the Leverham Trust, the engineering and physical Sciences Research Council, the Royal Society, the British Academy, the Loudest Foundation and Industry. So welcome, Professor Michael. 20 minutes to you, for you. Thank you so much, Kewei, uh, for that uh, generous introduction. Uh, and thank you, Ian, Suzanne, Chunping, uh, for the invitation to speak today. Uh, and uh, let me share my screen and talk about um, what I see as priorities as we move forward uh, in using engineered bamboo for sustainable construction. Uh, and I want to uh, talk about how we can move away uh, from a past of uh, exploiting the earth for our building materials uh, towards a future in which we work with nature to cultivate our building materials. And bamboo uh, is an essential component of this. And uh, throughout this conference, uh, you will hear uh, and see uh, many wonderful examples of what has been and can be done uh, with bamboo. Uh, and I wanna hear outline what I think are four priorities uh, as we move forward. Um, and we want to be able to go from the forest uh, into long life products. Uh, we want to be able to make natural, efficient structural form from engineered bamboo. We want to be able to track those products as they go uh, uh, from the forest uh, through the mills to products. And we want to uh, enable policies uh, that allow for the carbon stored in bamboo uh, to be counted towards nationally determined contributions under the UN FCCC uh, convention. Uh, so these things I will outline today, uh, and it's all things that we work on 
at the Center for Natural Material Innovation in Cambridge, where we go from the scale of the cell wall uh, all the way up to uh, the uh, scale of the building. Can I just confirm that you can see my slides? They look great. Okay, thank you. Um, and the work that we do in, in bamboo and timber and other natural materials is to work very carefully on how we can use them as structural materials to replace uh, conventional materials of steel and concrete, uh, carbon fiber and fiberglass, and go from the reinforced concrete buildings uh, that you see on the left uh, to more uh, naturally uh, grown buildings, such as you see on the right, uh, the world's tallest timber building uh, at the moment in Norway at, at 85 meters tall. Um, and this is good uh, for two main reasons. One uh, is that the, these natural materials store carbon uh, and they are lower embodied carbon uh, than uh, steel or concrete uh, by almost any measure. And then uh, there is a, an offset uh, that we get by displacing steel and concrete that otherwise we would have used. Um, so let me talk about these four priorities uh, over the next uh, few minutes in the course of my talk with, with some examples from bamboo and timber. Uh, we want to be able to go from these bamboo forests uh, into long life products. Uh, and we want to be able to do that uh, while maintaining uh, the state of sustainability of those forests uh, and the longevity of those products. And we see here how the combs come into a, a, a factory. Uh, they are processed uh, into sheets and then end up in boards uh, of one kind or another. And there are many ways to do this and they are expanding over time uh, as we learn more and more. And one of the ways we do that in timber is to create these very large sheets of cross laminated timber, as many of you will know. And this enables us to build uh, either flat pack as you see on the left or modular as you see on the right and use these materials uh, in residential, uh, commercial, and administrative buildings uh, that are ever growing in height. And here you see the first uh, high rise residential building in London by Watt Thistleton Architects. And the scale of this and other buildings is, that, uh, is the same of the uh, first steel framed skyscraper, uh, the Home Insurance Building by William LeBaron Jenny in 1885 in Chicago. And in under 50 years, we went from this building uh, to the 381 meters of the Empire State Building uh, in New York, uh, using exactly the same steel frame system clad in masonry or stone. And so we see no reason why we can't do that in timber and bamboo. And we've been working on a, a series of, of high rise buildings. This is a project with Perkins and Will and Thornton Tomasetti for a uh, 250 meter tall, 80 story building uh, on uh, the Chicago River. Uh, this is designed using primarily laminated veneer lumber, uh, but the properties of that are, are quite similar to what one can get uh, from engineered bamboo. But one of the most uh, remarkable things about that project was not so much the engineering, but what we uh, were able to arrive at as a way of construction, uh, which is modular construction on a much larger scale uh, than is possible uh, using uh, traditional trucks and on the roads. Uh, because it was a riverfront site, we could design the building in modules that would fit on barges. And then these barges could be shipped into place and the building erected. Uh, and this is something we can certainly do with engineered bamboo. It, it fits uh, very well with a factory environment of modern uh, offsite construction. And looking at projects and products differently uh, and thinking about different ways we can do it uh, is one of the ways uh, that we can ensure that we go from the bamboo forest into uh, products that have a very, very long life, uh, the longer the better, and, and buildings I think are probably the longest lived of our 
natural material products. Um, the second uh, priority is for us to design natural, efficient structural forms. Uh, and so here, again, you see um, a bamboo factory uh, producing uh, strips and boards that eventually become a beam, uh, which in the lower right you'll see is, is solid. Um, structural performance is good, very good. Uh, but bamboo is, is wildly stronger than timber, but it's not a whole lot stiffer. Um, and we've designed this with a section a bit like a tree, uh, and I think we can do better. And similarly here, you see the production process of scrimber, uh, which are just uh, pieces of bamboo crushed uh, and glued together into a very solid mass. Um, this, uh, because of its uh, solidity and density, uh, is a very good uh, flooring uh, material, hard wearing material, but again, as a section, it looks like a piece of wood uh, rather than the hollow that we're uh, accustomed to see uh, from bamboo as it grows in the forest. Um, so one of the challenges that we're working on and that I would uh, encourage uh, any colleagues uh, interested to work on, and I know some already are, is to uh, devise ways that we can go from the natural calm uh, to an engineered uh, forerunner material, and then take those engineered materials and reform them into natural efficient uh, structural forms uh, along the lines of uh, the cylindrical shape of the column, uh, but with the regularity and predictability that architects, engineers, and contractors uh, all require for projects around the world. And if we're going to do this, uh, build within bamboo on a very, very large scale. Uh, we need to do this with uh, regard for stewardship of people and the environment. And my daughters uh, look at me and say, Dad, but aren't you cutting down all the trees and all the forests? And I say, well, yes, uh, but not all of them. And in fact, with bamboo, uh, as with many trees, they, uh, they sequester the carbon as they grow. Um, but then that benefit uh, can be compounded if we harvest the bamboo, uh, turn it into long life products, and then allow the uh, bamboo to regrow, or in the case of forests, we replant the trees and use that space to grow more trees and store more carbon. Um, and there are many benefits to this, and agriculturally, bamboo and uh, for uh, bamboo and, and food crops don't need to compete because uh, bamboo will grow on, on much more degraded and hilly land uh, than you need for a tractor. Um, but in order to make this possible in the long term uh, and long term benefits, we need to be able to track uh, how that material comes from the forest, how it goes into a mill and then from the mill into those long life products uh, so that we know that uh, one of these columns in this picture, for example, which stored carbon throughout its life, uh, then continues to store carbon uh, throughout its uh, life as an engineered product. And that's, that's something that we are working on. It's something that colleagues are working on in timber as well. And it's something that will be essential to making uh, uh, a step change, I think, in the use of bamboo as a construction material around the world. Now, if we look at timber um, and we look at this building in the background, uh, the embodied carbon uh, dioxide to build that building in timber, it's a, it's a four story uh, residential building here in Cambridge, uh, 126 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Um, had it been built in concrete, it would have had two and a half times as much uh, emissions and almost four times as many emissions uh, in steel. Uh, the numbers for bamboo uh, probably would be similar, uh, although we might have built it out of a frame of, of, of structural bamboo rather than panels of engineered timber. Um, but this is before we take into account that every kilogram of bamboo uh, holds 1.8 kilograms of CO2. Uh, the numbers are similar for timber. And nature does this math um, because it stores the carbon as biomass uh, in the bamboo uh, and gives us back the oxygen to breathe. Um, 
And when we take that into account, um, there are 126 tons of carbon uh, dioxide emitted uh, from the 300 cubic meters of timber, uh, which therefore store uh, even more carbon dioxide equivalent, 540 tons. So this carbon storage potential of natural materials uh, is something that we need to celebrate uh, and exploit. And over a very long term, uh, we can remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it in our buildings in cities. And, and here you're looking at a roof truss uh, from 19, uh, sorry, from 1596, uh, during the reign of the first Queen Elizabeth, uh, that's still doing very well, uh, holding up one of our medieval halls, hall roofs here in Cambridge. Um, and in order to make this possible, uh, we need policies that will enable that carbon storage to be accounted for uh, by countries uh, in their nationally determined contribution. So we have um, some engineering challenges, uh, but we also have uh, some uh, policy challenges if we are going to make uh, most of the huge and growing potential uh, for engineered bamboo to be part of the solution to uh, the climate emergency. And here in England alone, uh, we need 340,000 houses a year. Uh, so that's the potential uh, to store something like 9 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, uh, something uh, that is not negligible and an opportunity that we should as much as possible take advantage of. So really, uh, it's only up to our imaginations uh, that we should uh, not limit ourselves in what's possible, uh, the potential we see uh, for using bamboo uh, to go from uh, the forest into long life products, for those long life products to be naturally uh, efficient and to be able to track them. And if we can track them, then governments will be able to account for them. And this uh, will enable uh, engineered bamboo to make an ever greater contribution to sustainable construction. And uh, this work uh, I'm delighted to present to you is made possible by a very large number of colleagues. Uh, many thanks to them and thanks to all of you. And if we have time for questions, I'm certainly happy to take them. So thanks a lot to Professor Michael Ramage. He showcased the great potential for both timber and bamboo and the modern construction material. And also pointed out several challenges uh, we made uh, includes engineering challenges as well as policies. So uh, one question for Michael, um, definitely uh, right now Bamboo can learn uh, something, nor or not from timber, timber constructions. So what is the most efficient way for Bamboo to be accepted by the main uh, stream construction sector? Um, that's a great, great question. So what's, what, what can bamboo learn from timber construction uh, towards acceptance? Um, and I think, there, I think there are two, two routes, um, at least two, maybe three. Um, all of them are, are underway uh, in, in the bamboo world. So one is, one is through these uh, exemplary demonstration projects, which have been uh, going up around the world, um, examples of great architecture and engineering um, that uh, colleagues have been leading. Um, the other is through um, uh, standards, and I know Kerwei, you and others have been have been leading that in in ISO. Um, and I think, lastly, um, it's a it's a matter of becoming more and more familiar with the material. Um, the uh, architects and engineers and other designers won't specify bamboo as a material if they don't know how to use it. Um, and uh, since I'm a teacher at Cambridge, you won't be surprised to hear that I think we need to teach it more widely and more broadly. 
uh, in our in our schools and universities that that these materials are ones that are not exotic. Uh, they are mainstream, and we should turn to them uh, at every opportunity uh, before we look to steel and concrete, which uh, I'm looking forward to the day when we can call them legacy materials. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot for the answers, from Michael. So, uh, yeah, do you yeah want there, to... uh, just another quick question, if I may, uh, Michael, uh, where do you see the greatest potential uh, uh, for market growth? Is it in developed or developing countries? Is it affordable single family housing or specialized application like tall buildings? Um, that's also a great question. So where, where is the most potential growth? Um, my experience uh, with engineered bamboo uh, is that it's in, as, a, as an engineering structural material, um, it's, its closest parallel is, is with steel um, as, a, as a frame member. Um, and so I, I would look to, to steel uh, and the market in steel to see ways that it can can use uh, be used around the world and we and we know that steel has very high end uh, applications as well as uh, very routine applications um, and so I, I I look at bamboo as a global commodity uh, despite the fact that it's you know produced mainly in uh, as an engineering material in in China uh, and uh, to a certain degree in Colombia. Uh, but I, I want to see, I want to think of it as a, as a global commodity um, and that it has, there are opportunities for applying it in, in a range of different contexts. Uh, uh, Kawei, there's a few questions that we've got uh, in the question and answer section, and maybe we could start looking at some of those because we still have a few minutes before the next speaker. Uh, here's one that is around uh, the elasticity of bamboo uh, and uh, 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 Michael, you mentioned that bamboo is much more elastic than wood. How can we take advantage of this for making uh, buildings? Um, so in, in our work, we've looked at, at using uh, these tougher materials. Um, we have to think about the buildings a little bit differently um, and that uh, we have to push the structure to the outside uh, and uh, bamboo often uh, and timber buildings in, in tall buildings, uh, because we're working with a different uh, set of material properties from steel or concrete, we end up with uh, what you know some some type of diagrid. Um, we also see that in traditional bamboo construction that the the efficiency of the material comes from the form uh, rather than just uh, doing whatever you need with the way we do with steel and concrete. So the one has to think very carefully uh, and work with the material properties um, and that gives us a, a different form uh, and in in our experience it's often a diagram very good uh, the um, there's many questions here i'm just trying to pick a few now and hopefully uh those that aren't asked can be um, can be uh, answered offline later but uh, uh Here's one here uh, that really touches on the cost aspects, uh, uh, the, the price points, let's say, uh, comparisons between conventional RCC or steel buildings, uh, as well as, I guess, uh, 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 lumber. Uh, could you care to comment on that? Maybe from a UK um, perspective. Yeah, so from a, um, from a UK perspective, um, our experience is that bamboo is a little bit more expensive than timber, uh, but that's mainly because the market is very small. Um, and this is the bamboo that we use. It's uh, in the, uh, you know, around Europe, bamboo makes, makes excellent floor, flooring and is used very, very widely uh, and competes very, very well with all the other uh, flooring materials, natural and, and less natural. Um, in, I think in, in terms of material cost, it's also very project specific. Um, and often, in, uh, certainly we see with timber that timber as a material is much more expensive than concrete if you look at a uh, volume. But by if you do the whole cost of the building, the timber building and the concrete building are, are often very, very similar. Uh, 
um, and then it becomes a question of the commodity price rather than um, the actual um, which one per cubic meter is more expensive. Um, so it's it's quite uh, there, there's another element to this, which is that um, as we make more and more bamboo products and bamboo buildings, the price will come down, um, and that's a it's a little bit of a chicken and egg scenario. We need we need more cheaper buildings, uh, but we need more cheaper products to do that. And which one's going to lead is is um, it's a difficult question. It, it's one that we're sort of lucky to be in the middle of as um, academic researchers and designers um, and design researchers, because we're uh, all of us uh, here, I think, are driven by curiosity uh, and creativity about bamboo. But uh, because we're in an academic environment, we're not driven by we're driven by different constraints. So um, it's one of the reasons we like to do uh, demonstration projects that we we hope can carry over into the commercial world. And I, I know I see that with with colleagues around the world as well. Uh, Kuwait, uh, I guess we're running out. Of, we're ending our time on uh, this first uh, presentation. Uh, we should maybe mention that a lot of these questions that we do have here could come up later in the panel discussion, okay. but maybe we should move on now uh, to the next speaker. So let's thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. So not Michael. So uh, let's move to the next uh, speaker, Professor Inke Chui uh, from Univers University of Alberta, Canada. Dr. Inke Chui is currently professor and industrial research chair of Natural Sciences of, and Engineering Research Council of Canada in Engineered Wood and Building Systems in Department of Civil and uh, Environmental Engineering and University of Alberta. Prior to joining the University of Alberta, he was New Brunswick Innovation Research Chair in Advanced Wood products and director of the World Science and Technology Center and at the University of New Brunswick. Dr. Chui is one of the Canada's leading experts in the field of timber engineering, specializing in engineered wood products, dynamic behavior of timber structures, non-destructive evaluation and timber connections. He has over 30 years of research experience and published over 200 articles in refereed journals and conference proceedings in these disciplines. Dr. Chu is actively engaged in building codes and design standard development in North America and at the international level. He is currently member of the stand, Standing Committee of Structural Design of the National Build, Building Code of Canada and a number of CSA technical committees on design of timber structures and wood products. He also chairs ASTM Technical Committee, D07 Wood, and ISO Technical Committee 165 Timber Structures. So the floor is yours, Shui. Thank you very much, uh, Kiwei, for the nice introduction. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for the invitation, and that will also allow me to reconnect with some old colleagues uh, uh, of mine, uh, Ian and, and Chunping. And I'm very glad to be here. Just want to make sure that I, you can all see my, my slide, right? Slide looks good. OK, great. Thanks. Um, so I was up, I was asked to talk about the uh, standardization route for uh, engineer bamboo as a as a building material. Given my uh, background, experience, and interest in participating in standardization activity for a long time, uh, as Kiwi mentioned, I'm actively involved in CSA building code and ASTM, and also chair of IC ISO Technical Committee TC one sixty five. So with this presentation, I hope to share some information with the audience with regards to what we're currently doing in the ISO technical committee. And then I have a suggestion at the end for uh, some kind of a path forward 
to allow uh, engineer uh, bamboo to be used um, uh, uh, recognized as a mainstream material as Professor Remy just mentioned. So before I talk about bamboo, uh, this is the a slide that's kind of introducing the new generation of engineer uh, wood product that allow us to kind of construct tall building that uh, Professor Remy just mentioned in his presentation. And this is the, at one point, the tallest wood building in the, uh, in the world, 18 story student residence uh, building in, on, the, on the UBC campus. And the main driver, as we all know, is uh, the, uh, of the, the interest in using wood is of course the, uh, the, the green credential of, of wood and the fact that it's renewable and, and sustainable. Um, and I think I mentioned wood engineer wood because there's some lesson that could be learned from 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 that process that uh, that the development process uh, leading from being a kind of a one off construct uh, build, structural material to now more or less recognized as a mainstream uh, uh, structural material along with steel and concrete. Um, so we look at the, uh, the the range of product here, CLT, as we all know, Gulen, traditional product, and then there's more recent uh, development on st structural composite lumber and mass timber product like Dow laminated timber that are also getting uh, 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 more recognition uh, recently in, in producing or constructing these tall buildings. Uh, so, uh, um, more recently, as Professor Ramich mentioned in his presentation, there's also engineer bamboo that's been, the bamboo product has been developed and shown here the two product that also mentioned in his presentation is basically made by doing small strips of uh, 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 bamboo material, uh, hot press them into producing larger dimension that would uh, kind of approaching the size of potentially approaching size of, for example, GULAM and, and CLT. So the, the, the question as Ian also alluded to is, uh, can these be used in also construction of tall uh, building? And the, probably the answer would be yes, but how do we get there? And uh, so, uh, and I think that's been recognized already through the, uh, presentation and some of the questions that I saw on the chat is that there's, there's a need to move forward in terms of standardize uh, standardize the material or produce standards that allow uh, engineer bamboo to be recognized as mainstream material. And in my opinion, maybe I'm a bit biased because of my involvement with ISO, uh, the ISO process can really help uh, uh, play a key role in here. And I'll kind of explain why uh, in my presentation. So just a summary of what I would talk about, basically three parts. Uh, one is I'll start with just a bit of introduction of the standard the ISO standard development process. And then what we are doing in, within ISO TC165 in terms of uh, stand, developing standard for timber and more recently for bamboo product that are intended for structural application. And then I have a suggestion for engineer bamboo composite at the end. So ISO basically develops standard that can be intended to be directly adopted or used as model standard by member countries. Um, um, so the uh, traditional key objective is through that process of developing international standard. And if these standards get adopted or used as model standard, then we, we have a, a, the same set of standards across different countries around the world. And that facilitate trading of products between countries as well as uh, services offered by one uh, company from one country and, 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 uh, uh, in another one. Uh, so that's uh, the harmonization of standards is, is the key to allow that to happen. Um, and more recently, uh, ISO added a new objective, which is to contribute to the realization of United Nations standards, uh, sustainable development goals by year 2030. And among those goals include affordable, more affordable housing, shelters for uh, uh, basic, mainly de developing world or underdeveloped world, uh, activity that come at climate change, et cetera. 
And to me, I think if we use more of these renewable low carbon footprint material in construction, that would help, that would go a long way in helping the United Nations achieve the, um, some of the sustainable development goal. Uh, shown here are the four uh, main technical committee under ISO that uh, addresses uh, uh, renewable material. We have uh, TC89 that uh, cover wood-based panels such as plywood, TC165, which is the one I'm responsible for timber structures. And 287 uh, is concerned with sustainable processes for wood and wood-based products or developing standard for that. And 296 are for bamboo or tan product that are intended to, not so much for structural application, but for other applications like furniture. Uh, the, the scope of TC165, it's to uh, develop a standard that uh, are con concerned with structural application of wood-based product and related lignocellulosic fibrous material. That means uh, bamboo and potentially other agricultural fibers such as hemp, for example. Uh, so the, the, the key word is the structural application of the product. So that differentiate our activity from other committee that addresses uh, renewable or sustainable materials. And of course, if we promote uh, the use of uh, renewable sustainable material in construction then we're going to see more sustainable building and green building and that again as i said earlier goes back to fulfilling the uh, the, the the goal of the united nations uh, uh, the objective of uh, supporting the united nations sustainable development goal this is just a, a, a an overview of the membership of TC165. The secretariat is held in Canada, so I, I'm, I'm I'm the chair of the committee and the secretary also from Canada, and we have 30 participating members and then they spread out mainly throughout North America, Europe, East Asia, and Oce Oceania. And when we had also 34 observing members. And these are represented by the orange uh, 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 code on the on the screen here. And this again is this spread out between kind of Eastern Europe, not uh, South America, Africa, and certain part of uh, Asia as well. Um, before I talk about the standardization for timber and bamboo product, uh, perhaps it's useful to kind of provide an overview of what I see as a essential requirement for any product to be accepted by, by a local building authority uh, or building code. Uh, typically, there's need to be a, 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 man, a product standard that ensure the quality of the product. And then this product has to be tested and evaluated and the, and the, the test data kind of analyzed in a certain way, recognize or accepted way to develop design property that designers can use in designing structures. And of course, there has to be acceptable design procedure uh, in a design standard that allow the, uh, uh, um, the, des the design to be carried out uh, and checked by also the local authority and, and, and as, so that to make sure the structure will be uh, structurally safe and, and be, be, due to this requirement, there's actually different types of standards that need to be developed, including product standard, as I mentioned, standard for testing, standard procedure for developing design property, and also the design standard or design code. So that's basically is a list of the kind of a minimum requirement or essential requirement for any product to be accepted as a, as a mainstream material and publish with published publish design information in design standard. So parallel to that, the type of product that develop under TC165 can be classified into these four category of standard that I just highlighted. And the, the, the title of the committee is, is timber structures. So, so logically it started out as a technical committee that focused entirely on timber products that are used in structure application. Since 2013, uh, before I actually took over as chairman, uh, the committee decided to broaden its scope into uh, bamboo product intended for structure application. 
I think the, 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 the logic for that is that uh, there's a lot of expertise within the committee that could help bamboo to become uh, a standardized a material that uh, uh, to become a standardized material and not eventually accept the material for for structural application. So that's that's when the scope of the standard was broadened, although the title hasn't really been changed to reflect that. So to date, we published 44 timber related and three bamboo related uh, standard uh, since the, the start of the, the, the committee. Um, so this is a typical process uh, when when the committee decided to work on a particular product uh, stand or particular standard. So uh, for for timber related standard, uh, because there's a long history of using timber and structural application in building. So a lot of the uh, uh, country actually have their own national standards. So instead of starting from scratch, we typically would go and look for a national standard that we can adopt uh, as a base for an ISO standard. So a project leader would look at the various national standards like ASTM, SAN, CSA, and Australian standard, and see which one to be most suitable for, uh, for, for converting or adopting as, a, as an ISO standard. And it typically go through some process uh, uh, evaluation, modification, and then finally, when every member is happy with the content, it become a ISO standard. So, as I mentioned earlier, the the the, the, the goal of ISO is to harmonize standards across the globe. Uh, but typically, if you use if we start with a, net, a particular national standard uh, to convert that into ISO standard. Uh, it's quite difficult to achieve uh, harmonization because other countries would have their own national standard and it's quite difficult for to convince them that to abandon their national standard and adopt ISO. So true harmonization of timber standards has always been a challenge and difficult to, to achieve. So even though we had a, a large number of timber related standards developed, uh, they're mainly used by country that are adopted by country that hasn't got their own national standard. So uh, we don't really achieve what I would call true harmonization across the globe. Um, for, for bamboo, uh, because it's a relatively new product in, uh, for, for uh, construction purpose and for structural application in particular, so few national standards exist for structural bamboo. So in my opinion, this is actually an area where we can finally achieve truly harmonized international standard uh, for, for, for engineer bamboo uh, products. We, we started the process with uh, a few standards that's been published, as I mentioned earlier, but those three standards are related to uh, use of bamboo cones in structural application. Uh, so if you all know using that, uh, as a form, as a form of, of the material form, is quite difficult to really build uh, efficiently large uh, uh, structures. So we have the product standard that deals with grading of bamboo cone for structural application, testing of the bamboo cone to determine mechanical property, and then in last year we published a, a standard for for structural design of structure uh, built with the bamboo cone. So we we started with the the, the process of developing a uh, standard for kind of basic bamboo cone material. More recently, we broadened the, the activity to try to address or cover or develop standard for engineer bamboo uh, product. Uh, so currently we have a few ongoing projects under the ISO TC165 developed uh, 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 standards for uh, engineer bamboo. Uh, so we had a, uh, a project going on in terms of developing uh, uh, product standard, product specification of dual laminated bamboo. Uh, there's a standard uh, in being developed to cover the test method uh, to determine physical mechanical property of engineer bamboo product. And then there's an interest in uh, uh, with early stage of that project is to develop a, a, a design standard uh, mainly covering structure that are built with the engineer bamboo products. So we're moving 
uh, ahead with the uh, uh, activity to develop standard that will support the use of engineered bamboo in structural applications. Uh, so that leads me to my suggestion for the audience and for the community to what we can do to try to harmonize engineer bamboo products across the, the globe. And I think we have a great opportunity here. Uh, as we started out, uh, as I said, kind of relatively fresh with very few national standards that cover the, uh, this product at this point. So my suggestion is to actually move towards uh, adopting what I would call a structural class system for engineer bamboo composites. And I, I took the liberty of kind of uh, working on uh, um, a small project to try to see how that can be done myself. So I, I work on with my collaborator, Professor uh, Dong -Sing, uh, Huang Dongsing at the uh, Nanjing Forestry University. He did a comprehensive test program on engineered bamboo composite materials. So he took the sample from four provinces, four producers, uh, six different product, the laminate of veneer bamboo, para strand bamboo, that are made with different type of adhesive. So they, so these product would have different mechanical properties. So the four provinces that provide the material are Jiangxi, Huinan, Fujian, and Sichuan in China. And uh, so I, I, I took a look at his data, his test data, and I, I tried to kind of see uh, what would be a structural class system might look like for engineer bamboo composites. So I came up with that information uh, summarized in this table. So I could tentatively, I call this uh, structural class uh, BC1 to BC4. And then in the, in each, under each of these columns, the design uh, requirement, property requirement for bending string, tensile string, compressive string, shear shrink modulus and density. So density would be required for connection design purpose. So I, 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 see, I see this structural class system where it can be adopted and looking at the test data from Dr. Huang's uh, program, I can classify the different product of different provinces, different producers into the, uh, the, the four structural class such as summarized on the in the table here. So uh, Fujian LVB, Huinan LVB and Sichuan LVB would go into the BC1 structural class category and Huinan PSB uh, and Jiangxi PSB would go into the structural class BC4. So PSB typically would have more, would have better mechanical property than uh, laminated and near bamboo. So the benefit of having a structural class is that from, from, the benefit, from the benefit of the end user and specify and designer, they can easily substitute one product from another uh, as, compo as compared with the traditional way of specifying product is we have to specify the, the, the species of the wood and in this case species of bamboo or manufacturer and the product and the, uh, the gray sometime. So, if that's very rigid, so if one, sorry. Uh, I would like to remind you two minutes left. Yes, I'm, oh, this is my last line. Uh, okay, the, so the benefit for the end user is that you can, you can, he or she can substitute one product very easy. So if he specify Fujian LVB and that's not available, then the, the, the builder and the, the, the user can actually go and pick up Queen and LVB as a subject because they would be classified under the same structural class. So the benefit for the producer would be that they would the the table that that's shown here, they know they 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 know the target uh, property that could be uh, that they want to target. And the other option, the other benefit would be because typically when one production you have different uh, uh, quality, uh, range of quality, and with certain grading technology, the different quality, different grade of uh, uh, engineered bamboo product can be uh, extracted from the same process if the, if the producer wants to do that. 
So to me, this adoption of the structural class system would certainly go a long way in harmonizing standard for engineer bamboo and therefore facilitate the use of product across the countries, across diff different countries. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you much for your attention. Thanks a lot for Chui's excellent presentation. So Chui shared with us about how to promote bamboo construction by establishing ISO standards. Um, I uh, actually, I am also the convener of uh, working group 12 within TC165 with Chui, working with Chui for several years. So um, actually in the past 20 years, we basically already established the frame of the, the uh, bamboo construction standard, uh, international standards for both round pole bamboo structures as well as engineered bamboo structures. But my question uh, is that how we can promote the adoption or adaption uh, of ISO standards to, to promote uh, uh, its legal, legal forces in, in countries. Okay, um, yeah, that's a good, that's actually our, always been our, our main goal um, to uh, when, when the, the, the scope of TC165 is in broadened. And, and as, I, as I mentioned in my presentation, we had a great opportunity to actually uh, come ahead of the national process. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the, 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 the timber community, they all have their own, many countries have their own standards. So it's quite difficult for harmonization. And that actually provides some barrier in terms of when we want to ship, let's say CLT from, from Europe to Canada, for example, the, 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 the CLT uh, was produced according to the European standard. So in, when they ship to Canada uh, or US or another country, then it, 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 the whole process needs to be repeated in terms of developing property that would adhere to the Canadian system or ASTM system. But, but if we started out this process of standardizing, harmonizing, harmonization of bamboo uh, uh, standard, then every country uh, would probably look at it and say, okay, if you want to use bamboo in, in uh, uh, engineer bamboo in construction, they might look at the ISO standard and, oh, there's already a standard developed. So let's adopt that rather than starting our own process to do that. So I, I think, I think we, there's a great opportunity here if we move fast enough before the national process kind of get ahead of us. That's, that's my, that's my, goal, objective, and then hope as, as chair of TC-165. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, we've, uh, we've been scanning the questions and a recurring theme with the last two talks has been around adhesives. And yeah. uh, we all know that when we talk about engineered bamboo uh, uh, products, we're talking about a lot of adhesive. And yes. the, 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 the key there then would be uh, the uh, opportunities that might exist on looking at uh, alternative to fossil-based adhesives and obviously something like lignin maybe and so would you care to comment on that and what's the potential for really moving quickly on this so that we can have a completely green story when it comes to uh, this material yeah uh, for i think that's a good question and i always wonder about that uh, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on natural based adhesive, but my understanding is that uh, it, it's probably uh, still a, quite a bit of work need to be done in terms of improving the durability. And maybe some of the experts in the audience can correct me if I'm wrong, because for, for product to be accepted for structure application, the adhesive use must be durable and subjected to really rigorous uh, uh, freeze thaw process, delamination test. And, and, and I think that's probably going to be a challenge to me, even for using the more traditional, from what I can see, even using the more traditional, the accepted like phenol uh, uh, Maldi adhesive for, for, for engineer bamboo. So that's, that's actually would be a, a, a challenge uh, along with a few others that I, I, could, I could maybe co comment later on. Good. Uh, 
uh, Kuwait, uh, should I now introduce the next speaker? Uh, or, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Maybe I. Or you, uh, if you have, if you were planning to go ahead, uh, uh, and then uh, I can okay, do the okay. one after. Okay. Please. Okay. So um, let's welcome Mr. Donald Davis from the Magnuson Clement Kick Associates of the USA. Don Davis is president of Magnuson Clement Kick Associates, a 185 person award winning, winning structural and civil engineering firm founded in 1920 and headquartered in Seattle. His 35 years of MKA projects include towers and tall as 105 stories and located in more than 19 countries and 15 major metropolitan centers. And industry chapping for the promotion of the urban density, sustainable design and low carbon construction. Don has helped fund the MKA Foundation, the Carbon Leadership Forum and Building Transparency. He is also a senior fellow of the Design Futures Council and has been inducted into the UC Berkeley Academy of Distinguished Alumni. So welcome, Donat Davis. Now you can share the screen. Thank you very much. And uh, just checking there, are you guys, uh, uh, do you see my screen right now? Yeah, yes. slide looks good. Okay, great. So, well, thank you for that introduction and thank you for this opportunity. Um, listening to the last two speakers, I think they're, my presentation is actually gonna hit on some very similar themes, frankly, but hopefully from a slightly different perspective of what we're gonna talk about. So as a structural engineer, I, I spend all my time thinking about how do we make these buildings stand up and how do we use our materials more efficiently. And I'm going to spend my time here talking about the sustainable benefits of bamboo. And, but where does bamboo have a competitive advantage? Um, but more importantly, I want to talk about the strategy of how and where we should be targeting our energies to bring engineered bamboo products forward and spend some time on specific engineered bamboo systems um, where I see bamboo having great competitive material advantages. Now, I know especially for this audience, uh, I don't necessarily need to explain this as much as I do to others, but bamboo can grow in four to seven years, what it would take 40 to 60 years to grow in timber. Um, ultimately, that point alone is bamboo's biggest differentiator um, in the future. When we move to more bio-based fibers as a building block for a built environment, whatever those fibers might be, we need them uh, grown quickly and we need them renewably sourced. And uh, what bamboo can do um, is unique there. Now, when you cut a tree, all of the root infrastructure required to transport water vertically, what it needs to grow, um, it dies. It has to be regenerated with every new tree. And that's really the secret of bamboo. Bamboo, being a grass, uh, has its root structure that stays alive when it's cut. And so all the new energy grows into new vertical fiber growth while the underground plumbing stays uh, functional and maturely efficient as long as there's water and nutrients to let the material grow. Um, as was said earlier, bamboo fibers also can have twice the strength of pine and, and can have additional stiffness. Um, but what happens next? Uh, how and where we use these fibers within the buildings has obviously been one of the challenges of getting more bamboo into the built environment. And it's something I think we're just starting to talk uh, more about as, as we need to. And I'm gonna talk about mass timber for a moment, using it as an example, and frankly, to point out some things that uh, the mass timber industry, I don't think has totally been getting right, but is finally, I think, starting to advance on. Um, Significant resources have gone into promoting mass timber as a building material, um, but it's really been focused on all timber uh, buildings for as a fiber, but also in all the applications that it goes into. And there's a real secret there uh, that most, if you talk to any structural engineer, they will tell you all buildings are hybrid. You show me a building that's called a mass timber building, and I can show you a significant use of concrete, steel, and other materials in that building. 
when we're creating the built environment, we effectively have a world of unlimited demand, but limited resources to, to build from. We're gonna use all the materials at our disposal. We need to use each though, uh, where it is most efficient, where it does more than one job. And ideally, yes, where it is most renewable, but they're all gonna have an application in there in some place. And um, I actually think the timber industry's focus on all timber buildings for all applications has actually slowed the adoption of building, bringing that uh, building product into the market in a bigger way. There's a lot of energy for sure that's been going into the mass timber building. Um, but if you really look at what's built versus the hype and renderings, there's still a, actually a fairly limited number of true mass timber buildings that are going up. Um, because I think the focus has been uh, solving challenges that sometimes don't need to be solved. Uh, and it would be a better focus on more limited applications, but happening more frequently in our built environment. So when we talk about the engineered bamboo discussion, we really got to be looking at the same thing. And so I'm going to start this. Actually, I want to talk about other materials first. We need to not think about a material just in isolation and what it does, but we need to think of its application, how it works with other materials. So concrete. Uh, you know, of the three core structural materials, concrete, steel, and bio-based products, be them timber, bamboo, or others, um, concrete's unique. Now, cement, uh, without question, accounts for 25% of global industrial CO2 materials, uh, emissions. It's not a bad thing. We just use a lot of it. And, uh, but it also has some unique applications where, uh, uh, I don't think concrete is going to go away in our future. Um, show me a building of any significant size and I'll show you a concrete foundation. Uh, it has a place in the market. We need to get lower carbon footprint with what the concrete does, but it, it has unique applications. Um, it's because of that footprint though, and we simply use so much of it uh, that we want to find these other materials. But, but uh, concrete foundations, concrete topping slabs is uh, fire, uh, inert material, uh, non-combustible are all benefits. What the concrete industry has been doing on a sustainability front to its benefit is we now can get environmental product declarations, especially in Europe and North America. Uh, they're coming in Asia, a little bit slower process, where we can get a pretty good track record that tells us the upstream sourcing of that material, where it comes from, the carbon footprint of those materials, it's not industry average data, it's very vendor specific data. And we can use that in our decision making process to drive towards lower concrete solutions. That's what's happening in the concrete space. When we talk about steel, uh, steel for tension and bending, um, I do agree that engineered bamboo products can start to uh, move into the space of steel, but fire protection engineering is one of the, again, the really big challenges in our bio-based products. And that's really often more of a challenge for the wood solutions and bamboo solutions more than the um, strength applications. But uh, steel and tension, steel and bending, those are, the, those are where uh, steel does its best job. So concrete and compression, steel and tension. And the steel industry also with these environmental product declarations is moving past industry average data to very vendor specific data we can tell what mill it comes from, the energy footprint of those mills. We can create inner material competition to uh, pick the best steel when we do have to put steel into our buildings. So then we move on to the engineered fiber-based materials. Uh, I'll talk about mass timber here and then we'll move into bamboo. Um, Wood-based materials are really, really good and efficient and cost-effective for car uh, covering large surface areas. Look at the floor systems. Um, they're also very efficient for bending. Now, if we look at a building, and this is the secret, low-rise, high-rise building, over 50% of the building, often about 70% of the building is in the floor system. You wanna get uh, more adoption of the material, just solve the floors, let's change them into more fiber-based, uh, bio-based products, uh, and not be solving some of the other challenges that we are, have been trying to do with wood um, where a very limited use of steel can be, or concrete can be a really efficient way to solve the same problem. It will actually create more adoption of the material faster. 
challenge with the wood industry is the EPDs that are out there though are still only industry average data. Um, the timber industry really works hard to avoid inner material competition and it still hides behind industry average data that does not create the differentiation between the upstream sourcing where the material comes from. Uh, and so the EPDs uh, don't have that vendor specific data that is coming forth under concrete and steel. It's more complicated with wood, but uh, it's a growth area uh, that that's being spent. Getting that uh, differentiation upstream, though, to tell the carbon story specifically of where material came from and celebrating uh, that carbon footprint of what happens at the land, that's going to be important for bamboo because that is ultimately where bamboo has some of its best differentiators, even with wood. Um, they're both bio-based products. They both store a sequester a certain amount of carbon. The bamboo just grows it that much faster. And so even in the wood applications, um, that's going to be the differentiator uh, from a sustainability perspective and how we can quantify that information that needs to come forward with bamboo. Now, fiber density and orientation matters. Um, you know, when we look at wood-based products and pine, if I load the wood in the direction of the cell grains, claw-free Douglas fir is about 8,000 PSI in strength. That's stronger than much of the concrete that might be under our feet. When I turn it 90 degrees, the cells crush. And uh, it is a much lower capacity, much lower strength. Um, we need to bring that into our building designs when we choose to work with the fibers and materials. Frankly, bamboo uh, has many of the same things. It's just stronger. Um, but it is much stronger in the direction of application of, of the cell growth than it is in the cross section. Uh, we need to bring that into our engineering building solutions, how we use the fibers to take them to the most competitive and best advantage. So I'll show you just as an example with CLT, one of the challenges with CLT and where uh, the near systems like mass plywood panels or some of the applications that were shown earlier here with bamboo are so effective is if uh, floor panels being used primarily in one way flexural bending in a CLT panel, 30% or more of the fibers are oriented in the wrong direction for that flexural strength. Um, there's a lot of consumed material that isn't being used in its uh, most efficient application. That's one of the secrets that has been for a long time behind dowel laminated timber or DLT or na nail laminated timber. It's fiber oriented. All the fibers are in the direction of uh, primary bending. And uh, simply put, we can carry the same load with 30% less material in a one-way span in an NLT or DLT system than we can with a cross-laminated material. And so that's, that's where DLT has had a competitive advantage. All materials have their applications, but when we think about um, bamboo, we think about fibers, strand orienting the fibers in the direction of the load we're using it for is gonna be really important. Now in the timber industry, we already do this uh, when we make a glue lamb bean. We select the species and the grades of the fibers. We put stronger fibers on the outside of a glue lamb bean and low, use lower grade fibers in the middle. I totally see a future here where this isn't just a pine beam. This is a hybrid fiber based beam and those outer fibers are made with fibers that are stronger and stiffer, bamboo. Um, I actually think one of the biggest challenges facing the bamboo industry, uh, yes, it's the engineers knowing how to work with it, but it's actually the uh, production of the fibers being available in the products that we use in more uh, fiber optimized and fiber engineered solutions. And if we again go back to uh, we're in a world of limited resources, uh, we need to use our fibers wisely and we need to use them as uh, efficiently as we can. I think a future with glue laminated beams that are a mix of fibers, bamboo on the outside and maybe with a wood core in the center has a tremendous uh, opportunity to be brought forward. And so, you know, this is just shown an application of fiber oriented uh, efficient framing, glue lamb beams and down laminated timber. This happens to be <clears throat> one of the mass timber uh, office buildings we've done uh, for Heinz development. Again, focusing on 
the slab system because that's where the most material is in a building, low rise or high rise. And just that singular application, getting that one right. Um, I'm showing here the examples of the new high rise that where mass timber buildings can go into taller options with type 4C, type 4B, or type 4A building heights. So we can build up to 270 foot tall in hybrid and uh, wood-based solutions. We just have to cover it all up from a fire-based solution. The building code is moving to say you can, but the can you or should you and how much does it cost application, we're still, we're still working on that battle. But I think focusing on changing the deck and the floor systems is gonna be the best prize, the best opportunity. So here I'm, I'm showing, in this case, a steel frame, but with a slap on metal deck being replaced with a uh, bamboo or bio-based solution. And we recently did some testing on that. We actually did it in both uh, with dowel laminated or nail laminated, in this case, uh, pine. And we also did it with some uh, bamboo uh, boards. And we created a composite system where we took what was a typical six inch slab on metal deck, three inches of concrete with a three inch metal deck underneath it that you might have in a very traditional office building. We kept the same six inches, but we did it as a bamboo plank with a concrete topping. And we uh, put it in the testing lab and we tested it. And uh, we, we also looked at a number of different applications of how could we use that slab system. And so just to show you the pictures, okay, if we do it in a traditional steel building, just like a normal steel building, but we changed all the decking, uh, you might get something that looks like this. Now, in this case, I'm actually making the concrete and the bamboo fiber oriented planking work together as a composite system. I've got the bamboo covering for surface area. I have it working for the flexure. I have the concrete work in, working in compression. And so the two are working together and it's the same uh, six inch or 150 millimeter system spanning roughly uh, 10 feet or three meters as a, as a traditional steel office building. Now you could put that same uh, application on uh, glue lamb beams and could even be fiber engineered uh, uh, bamboo glue lamb beams or a mix of bamboo and uh, pine together. And there's hybrid solutions. This is one called a delta beam. Um, it can't span as far as a downturn beam, but uh, it, it's a system that can start to rival concrete flat plates where we do a discrete discretionary amount of steel in the columns on the girder lines with a, a plank floor system and a, and a uh, concrete topping to go between them. I, I think there's great promise in this solution or this one here, which would be using what I would call an, uh, like a girder slab inverted T-beam, very similar systems and applications. Taking it a step further, uh, if you wanted to uh, do all exposed structure in that type 4B system I showed you earlier, you could do precast columns, precast girders with that same wood fiber oriented decking and a concrete topping. Um, this structure can be built without having to do other fire adornment uh, up to 12 stories without other fire protection and would be um, accepted in the new um, 2021 uh, IDC uh, fire code. And uh, just to throw another application out there, this is uh, if anyone's familiar with uh, bubble deck or uh, some of the other variations of that uh, void slab, you can do the same thing where we could create the bottom uh, formwork and decking of that system with a bamboo fiber-based plank. Uh, we could use that plank for the tension reinforcement uh, and a hollow core or a void slab condition up above with the concrete on top of that. Now, we took that system that I described earlier, that uh, 150 millimeter or six inch thick half concrete, half bamboo plank, spanned it uh, 10 feet or roughly three meters. And here I'm showing the testing of that system carrying 1,200 pounds a square foot. That's roughly 10 times the load that we need to meet our life safety objectives on the building. It's a very, very durable, very strong material, frankly, stronger than we need. Um, the question is, what can we do to start using less of the fibers because they're too strong? Um, or things like vibration start to control the design more than strength. Incredible opportunity, I think, here as a place to enter into the market. 
Now, I mentioned earlier about uh, mass plywood systems and where uh, veneer systems of mass plywood, uh, I think, outperform CLT systems because we can basically engineer out the flaws of the material. And I think that was mentioned earlier. I think the work that uh, one of our later speakers here, Hal uh, Hinkle from BAMCOR and what they've been doing with mass plywood, uh, fiber optimized and mixed material uh, uh, wall systems is incredibly uh, forward thinking engineering uh, systems of bringing plywood panels into the market of uh, bamboo hybrids. And I think there's great opportunity there. Giving just as but one example of where that can go, here I'm showing uh, a warehouse construction where we could be uh, many of the warehouse distribution facilities that we build today, which might be tilt up concrete walls or slab on metal deck with open web choice. Let's only solve the problems we need to solve. Stay with the steel columns, stay with those open web choice, swap out the metal deck with a mass plywood roof, swap out the precast concrete tilt up walls with a engineered uh, wall system of plywood and uh, vertical glue lambs as stiffening elements intelligent use of the materials where it is most effective and use other materials uh, where they are also most effective. I think that's where we'll get more adoption in the system <clears throat> globally. Um, and so uh, just leaving with you with as a final slide, I would really, really encourage that when we think about our buildings and our opportunities for use of these materials, um, think of them as hybrid systems because they typically are going to be use the material at what it really, really does best in the applications where it is most effective and don't beat yourself up solving problems that don't need to be solved. If we do that, I think we will get more and faster adoption of the systems and the materials throughout the market. Um, and I think actually it's ultimately how we have the best conservation resources and how we use our materials together. So I'm gonna stop there. I will uh, open it up for questions or um, turn this back. Okay, thanks so much to Donat. Donat mm -hmm. shared uh, his, uh, his opinions and experience of how to use timber and bamboo in hybrid structures. Uh, actually, uh, I think in the market, the one of the biggest barrier for people to use bamboo or timber is the fire resistant performances because the, the market uh, in some countries is very hard for, for the market to accept them. So, uh, so in your opinion, what we, we should do to, to persuade the market to believe uh, bamboo uh, or timber, uh, both of them can meet the relevant requirements. Um, well, first, I'm going to agree with what you just said. I think the whole issue with bringing uh, bamboo or any bio-based, <clears throat> fiber-based materials into what we're doing, it's a fire challenge. Uh, you know, I, I always laugh at the who can build the tallest wood building, who's got the tallest wood building. It's, it's an interesting academic exercise. But if we just look at nature, I can show you some uh, pretty darn tall uh, skyscrapers in timber uh, called sequoia pine trees that uh, I think that nature still has us beat on who can build the tallest uh, uh, wood structure. It's not a structural challenge to go taller in wood, especially if we're using it in hybrid materials, it's a fire challenge. And the answer starts with prescriptive solutions like in the, the fire code that's coming for, forth in the 2021 IBC in more strategically thinking about where we use it. But then it's going to be the whole uh, industry of performance-based fire engineering and uh, defining what are the objectives we're really trying to achieve and how can we do that in, in other ways. So this can be strategic covering of some materials and exposing them in others. Um, it's why those hybrid solutions, I think, really start to make sense. If our vertical system, the columns, the bracing, the walls are non-combustible materials, but the floor systems are in the, the bamboo and the pine and the hybrid, I think there's no limitation on how high of a building we want to use that in. If we can come up with a, then a compartmentalization of how we manage the fire hazard in the building. 
And that vertical structure being non-combustible is what gives the fire engineers or, or the fire departments and the firefighters a surety of uh, better structural stability with height. Um, so it's, it's a combination of it, education. I, the one term I would use is performance-based fire engineering. And, and that as a profession really has to continue to evolve in advance. Thanks, yeah. Hey, to, to yeah, we have probably time for one more question and I'm, I'm scanning down the question and answers. And one that's come up a couple of times and I'll flag is the uh, uh, sh sheer strength issue. Uh, uh, one one that we got uh, uh, indicates that compressed strength of bamboo is nearly half of all its tensile strength, but bamboo is weaker in shear. How do we improve uh, the shear strength of bamboo? And that's come up a few times in the discussion. You will um, can you the, comment on that, Don? Sure, I, I, it's a good comment. Uh, to me, this is the beauty of uh, fiber engineered design. If you look, if you take things back down to the fiber level, you're absolutely right. The fibers have a strong direction and a weak direction. But if we are gonna create engineered wood products, let's start playing with uh, the orientation of the fibers and how we actually put those fibers into a uh, solution. So if it's like a diaphragm, um, this is where CLT or plywood really has uh, an ability to enhance our shear strength because we can orient the fibers in different ways. Um, it, ultimately, I think it comes down to creating engineered solutions, testing them to prove out the capacity. But I, uh, my, my best comment is you're not gonna change the fibers that we're working with, but we can absolutely change the orientation of those fibers. And there's a 10 to one difference in the application of capacity. Uh, so fiber-oriented engineering would, would be the term. Uh, I think about the problem that way and then see what solutions you can come up with. Uh, one thing that's really struck me about your presentation is, is your focus on optimizing material use and the real opportunities we have with hybrid construction. In, our, in, in other words, using uh, bamboo in combination with other materials, uh, including wood, uh, to optimize the performance. And I applaud you for that. I think that's excellent. And uh, the question would be in the last one, uh, how, how successful have we been in getting this kind of message across to uh, the key stakeholders, architects, engineers, et cetera? And what can we do to do it better? Um, I think our success has been limited simply because I don't see it in the market uh, to the extent that we need. I think it's a two prong issue though. I think you need to, in, uh, educate the engineers and the architects on the opportunity and the availability. I think that's the easy part. I think the hard part is the product has to be available in the market at the time that uh, the owner or the developers of building want to do it. If I, if I have a building today and I want to go build uh, uh, engineered uh, glue lamb beams that have bamboo in the outer fibers, or I want to go uh, bring those plywood panel, mass plywood panels, I have one supplier in North America I can go talk to about mass plywood, plywood panels. Uh, that's BAMCOR down in Florida. It's just not in the market. And if I want to go get an engineered bamboo beam, I can go talk to Lambu in uh, some limited land applications. There simply needs to be more. I don't think it's convincing engineers and architects. I think we need to get more production uh, supply into this to just kind of the availability of the marketplace. And then I think as soon as you can create some competition and there's more opportunity there, I think it will quickly be adopted simply because the superior engineered properties uh, and growth properties of the material. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent presentation. Really enjoyed it. Uh, I guess we can move on now to our next speaker, David Sands. Uh, David is director and chief products officer uh, for Rhizome. He, uh, an architect by training, David has been a relentless champion and promoter for greater use of bamboo in construction around the world. He developed the first U.S. building code standard for structural applications of bamboo products, and he's completed hundreds of residential bamboo projects over the last 26 years. The title of his presentation uh, is Building Construction from Round Bamboo to Engineered Bamboo. Over to you, David. Thank you. <clears throat> So let's see, let's share my screen here. Um, do that. 
Let's see. I need. Okay, I think I've got it. There we go. And uh, let's see. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, looks good. Great, okay. Um, yeah, so really this is a little bit of uh, uh, the background and then also where we are headed. Um, I, I really appreciated uh, the last presentation, just uh, talking about the, you know, the, uh, the needed uptake for bamboo and why that's so valuable and looking at hybrid solutions. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll just go, let's see, yeah. So the big overview for me is we need to be planting a lot of bamboo. That was one of the last question that came up is there's a uh, supply issue. Um, but we also need to be making innovative building materials out of it. And then we need to repeat that over and over and over again to get us up to, you know, the gigaton scale where we need to be to have a climate impact. Uh, you know, the rapid growth of the pine, of, of, of bamboo compared to pine is, uh, you know, it's a phenomenal difference. And so we really need to, to take advantage of that and, and uh, again, put it into play. And that's really what got me started. I, um, well, <laughs> I, I grew up playing in bamboo. It was a hundred year old uh, clump of vulgaris that uh, my close friend that I still work with uh, um, uh, grew up you know, play, making rafts and then as a scout making bridges. And, and then it, I started out in art school and my teacher was from China. And so I studied brush painting and uh, everything in the uh, brush painting, you learn bamboo first because all the strokes are there and it's considered the icon of the perfected human being. Uh, and then my inspirations were I'd, I'd gone to Bali and met Linda Garland. I saw some structures that Simone had done and both really inspired me to get involved. Um, yeah, that's, and so I uh, took bamboo through the building code process uh, and we got some class A clients just, to, it was really a conversation with Linda. She said, you know, we need to change the perception of bamboo in the world. So, um, We've done, you know, this is a house for Sammy Hagar on Maui, and we did uh, Barbara Hershey, the you know the Academy Award-winning actress, and uh, quite a number of other you know clients, and um, and then we also had the uh, opportunity to have them go through multiple category five hurricanes. So we've had, um, I think it's four storms with winds up to 200 miles an hour three and a half foot eaves, you know, this was in the Caribbean where most houses now are built like uh, they're basically concrete bunkers without eaves. And these were three and a half foot eaves in, in 200 mile an hour winds. Um, we've done, you know, Central America, um, a lot in Hawaii. And finally got into uh, multifamily housing. Uh, the, this was the upstairs is bamboo, the downstairs is conventional. Uh, and again, because of the fire uh, separations. So uh, back in 09, uh, uh, Suzanne will remember this. Uh, I had really gotten uh, concerned and inspired about what bamboo might be able to do. I'd read a National Resource Defense Council magazine and they uh, said how much CO2 humanity was putting into the atmosphere every year. And I'd recently read some uh, studies on uh, bamboo and the amount of carbon uptake in the bamboo. And just the obvious thing of it being the fastest growing plant, I thought, oh, this is a great thing. So I wrote up a paper, I got it submitted, got it accepted. And then uh, Walter, who's the 
top researcher in the world at the time submitted, circulated his paper to the other speakers about why, why bamboo did not work well for carbon sequestration. And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> so I reached out to, to Walter and he said, oh, I'd be happy to help, help you. Well, he, I read his paper and I realized, well, if I could address the issues that, that Walter brings up, I might have a good strategy. So I did that, I submitted it to Walter and he said, yeah, that would work. Meet me ahead of the conference and we'll work out some of the details. Uh, the two biggest ones were uh, that bamboo as a long-term carbon sequestration strategy requires harvest. And then the other one is the materials that you're cutting from it require long-term lockup of carbon. So uh, building materials are an obvious play for that. So that's our solution is just focus on building materials. And um, you know, starting with bamboo living and doing the round pole houses, uh, getting familiar with the building code process, um, really, uh, you know, gave us the traction to just get this figured out. So we're making uh, engineered materials now. We're just in the uh, early stages, still looking for that, you know, big uh, invest, direct investment, equity investment. So if you know anybody, let me know. Um, and we're making uh, materials now. Uh, and then also the, the wonderful thing with the bamboo and one of the pieces in terms of getting a, a large scale carbon sequestration programs going is the, the you know, the, um, the flexibility of the fiber use. So again, uh, looking at optimizing that fiber um, and then also, again, the, the best solutions are the building ones and biochar. The biofuels, you're putting it back into the atmosphere, uh, paper and cardboard. You're saving trees, but it's a, you know, it's a very short cycle back into the atmosphere. Uh, so really focusing on building materials and uh, really being uh, climate smart about it. Again, uh, we don't need to replace everything, but we do need to you know, generate a large space for bamboo in the uh, construction market. And then why hasn't been done? You know, if it's so superior, why isn't there already uh, you know, major building materials? I applaud Hal for getting out in front of all of this and, and making it happen. Um, it really, you know, and Lambda, and uh, that that that's really uh, creating a market for the materials. But we also need on to work on the uh, supply chain side. So uh, getting uh, bamboo in the ground, but that does require building markets at the same time. So it's a you know you can't have one without the other. Uh, and again, why now? So uh, the the Existing, you know, kind of market focus for bamboo building materials has been quite high in. And so we really need to be looking at how to simplify the, the production processes, how to shorten the supply chains and, um, and speed up that process. So uh, one of the fascinating things that I've been able to do is uh, you know, with our uh, project in uh, the Philippines is actually address all of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I don't know of another project that's actually doing that. Um, and we working with indigenous partners, we're, you know, uh, on the hustle to get this whole thing. Uh, we're up and running, but we really need to expand the operation. Uh, and again, that it's a direct impact on the economy. Uh, where jobs are highly needed. Um, again, uh, an area that's been uh, sadly deforested and um, really working to is uh, reforestation projects there. And then the last thing is, uh, and how I want to applaud you, uh, uh, BAMCOR and Rhizome both made it to the top 60 finalists for the Milestone Awards for carbon removal. So this was a global competition um, 
And really, just to make it to that level, it, uh, it was you know the the review of our uh, science behind it, the uh, strategies, and all of that. I, I was obviously disappointed not to actually get that million dollar grant because we could have really used it with our Philippine operation to that would have brought us and it that's basically what we need to bring us to uh, revenue positive there. Um, so we're again uh, committed to this. It's been 27 years in the trenches for me and I'm you know staying at it and uh, yeah I'm just grateful to <laughs> still be standing after all of the the uh, you know ch challenges that it's that it's been to get here. And it's so essential that this thing gets done. So uh, one of the pieces that I did is I said, well, okay, the first prize for this is 50 million bucks. If I had 50 million bucks, how would I solve the climate crisis? And it's an insane endeavor, but it's actually doable. It's doing what we're doing in uh, the Philippines, Vietnam and other places, and then doing it over and over and over again. And that's planting you know, tremendous amount of, of giant bamboos, uh, finding markets for those materials and turning those, those bamboos into uh, uh, building materials. And the, the incredible thing about that is because of the strength of the material uh, relative to other uh, building material options and uh, because of the emissions avoided by shifting construction to uh, bamboo-based materials, just getting to a level of 12% conversion of global construction to bamboo-based materials would address one third of our global CO2 of output. And again, it's because of the rapid drawdown, the, um, you know, the sequestration actually in the plants themselves and the avoided emissions by converting from other materials. And those plants again are living a hundred years and then, then uh, biocharring the waste. So that's uh, where I am at this moment. I'm uh, <laughs> um, still on the ground running and, and working to get this thing implemented. So I'm open to questions and thank you. Thank you, uh, David. Um, a very excellent talk, well appreciated. We are getting questions in which we're collating, but I could probably start off with one for you. Uh, it's, sure. uh, uh, it's around the fact that a lot of your work has been uh, in Hawaii. Uh, bamboo, while not native to Hawaii, has been there for several hundred years and is now really part of the culture. Uh, what's the best strategy could we have for introducing engineered bamboo in construction on the mainland where the wood culture is currently the mainstream? Sure. It's really, it's getting the price of the, the material to uh, a level that, that's actually competitive with wood products. So we're working very hard to get that figured out. Uh, so the, the pieces to that are having a large supply, a very short supply chain and uh, you know, industrialized products and, uh, yeah, and being able to scale that. Uh, there have been questions that are coming in around the environmental aspects because uh, today we're talking about, I think, uh, producing the bamboo in countries like potentially Hawaii, the Philippines, and what have you. And then there's that whole transportation issue, let's say, to the U.S. Sure. or Europe, uh, uh, Canada. And uh, the implication there is that are we factoring that in when we're doing our life cycle analysis? Because it yeah, seems we, that transportation would play a big part of this thing. It absolutely does. Um, but what's fascinating is, you know, there was a uh, Pablo, when, when he was a grad student, did a study for, uh, it was a bamboo, it was a project in the Netherlands, and it was bamboo and from Costa Rica, and then looking at wood, steel, and concrete uh, locally produced. And the bamboo, even with the shipping, was, you know, a better, um, uh, lower carbon impact. And so when we looked at, for bamboo living, uh, our uh, environmental footprint, uh, the shipping was not the highest uh, issue. It was actually the wood plywood we were using at the time. So that's 
another piece of actually getting the, you know, the developing affordable bamboo sheet goods. And uh, so that's, you know, anyway, the, the shipping is an issue and it does need to be addressed. The best way to do that is to create local markets for all the materials. Great. Uh, another question that came up uh, was from the Philippines. And uh, the question is, is there any social stigma with using bamboo in the Philippines and in other parts of the world? Uh, there, there traditionally has been. Um, you know, that was one of uh, Linda's uh, initial conversations to me is we needed to change that perception. Uh, some of it was about the, the durability and the lack of treatment. The other pieces were um, in terms of really, uh, what would I say, is, is, is seeing it as an aspirational material. So that's been, with Bamboo Living, that's been one of our goals is to, you know, get it to be something that's of real interest to, and, and it, we, we really feel like we're there. You know, it's really, an, uh, I, I want to, <laughs> I had a conversation with Clint Eastwood and he said, it's affordable oceanfront housing. You know, it's, it's really what people would like to be in, in beautiful, beautiful natural materials, beautifully made. Um, but it's really, we've got to get the price to be, uh, you know, competitive all around. And that's where we really get the transition. And when, uh, you know, I, I uh, just, first presentations in areas of the world where uh, bamboo has, has traditionally been, uh, you know, considered a, not a great material. When they see beautiful houses being done out of it, it's like, oh, I didn't know you could do that, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's really providing that, uh, the perception and the interest and, and uh, you know, that's, it's, it's an essential piece of the puzzle, for sure. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. Great uh, presentation pleasure. and yeah, uh, thank really you. appreciate it. Uh, our My next pleasure. speaker uh, is uh, Hal Henkel. And uh, Hal uh, is CEO of BAMCOR and its parent, Global Bamboo Technologies. Uh, Hal has had a very illustrious academic as well as business career, as you can see from the bio that was included in the package you received. Uh, throughout his career, Hal has demonstrated a very keen interest in sustainable construction and mitigating global ur urban poverty. That, this has eventually led him uh, into the world of bamboo. The title of his presentation is Changing the Material and Methods to Address Both Climate Change and Global Construction Pain Points. It's a pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Hal Henkel. Thank you very much. I hope that we mark this day in this conference as the beginning of the recognition of the valuable attributes of timber bamboo that can lead to its accelerated adoption. And that for the first time, we're joining together globally, architects and engineers and builders and scholars to advance the use of what I will call this gift of nature. And I fully understand that there's a lot of work to be done. And in ways we are, uh, where Wood was 50 years ago, maybe. But we also have the advances in building sciences in general and in wood sciences specifically that give us a huge body of intellectual capital that we get to build on. But we have very few years to make the advances that are urgently needed. With bamboo, we are changing the material in the built environment, but only because it leads to changes in methods. And with those changes in methods, we can improve the thermal envelope, which is critical for climate change. We can make advances in coordinated cloud-based design, which is where building is going. And we can feed into advancing industrialized construction, also absolutely required to provide buildings for the future. Together, these three changes in methods can help us lower the carbon, the cost, the labor, and the time to build. So I'm Hal Hinkle, and I get to lead a superb team at Global Bamboo Technologies, our technical name, but we're known more popularly just as BAMCOR. And I disclose that I come to the topic today 
with a commercial motivation. We've also helped found the World Bamboo Foundation with Suzanne Lucas to become a sibling organization. Excuse me, how, how, excuse me. I think your uh, slides is half cut. Maybe. Yeah, your, your slides are being cut off. We're only seeing part of it. There yeah, that's go. good. Okay, uh, my apology. Um, we, we've helped found the World Bamboo Foundation with Suzanne Lucas to be a sibling organization to uh, the World Bamboo Organization. And the World Bamboo Foundation has as its mission, the commercialization of timber bamboo to help mitigate climate change and rural poverty in the global South, part of the uh, development goals that David Sands was just talking about. We believe at BAMCOR that humanity faces two defining simultaneous crises. The first is the need to build, shelter, and house our brothers and sisters around the globe. And the second, simultaneously, is the need to address climate change by turning every new building we build into a carbon sink. With the material change to bamboo and the method changes that can follow, we believe this is possible and maybe even inevitable. Obviously, we carry three great legacy materials, concrete, steel, and wood, into these twin crises. Together, concrete and steel uh, production and application contribute just under 14% of global greenhouse gases. Concrete is the most produced and most consumed single product on the planet because it is so useful. And steel is so beautifully flexible in its uses that we wouldn't have the built environment that we have today without concrete and steel. Much is being done to green concrete and steel. But I'd like to suggest, I'd like to stipulate for today's presentation that there are physical thermodynamic limits to how far we can green these two legacy products, even when we assume we use 100% renewable energy to make them. Generally, that allows us then to think about how do we bring a faster fiber and a stronger fiber into the story? And that allows us to bring bamboo in to take the pressure off of wood. Because in the last 20 years, we've lost 10% of the global forest cover of wood. So with timber bamboo, we can now look at its attributes and then apply those attributes to see what method changes we can make in building. I believe there are many misconceptions about bamboo's growth rates. Factually wrong and unsubstantiable, unsubstantiable, claim, uh, unsubstantiable claims permeate the internet about bamboo's growth. Generally, the regeneration of timber bamboo is not that it grows to hold more carbon in a, in a mature stand than wood forests do. It doesn't. It's not because planting a new, a new timber bamboo uh, stand can reach maturity faster than wood does in a decade versus six decades at the extreme. It, it doesn't. I mean, it does that, but that's not it. It's that it's, that it's a grass and it grows differently. And, Dave, and uh, Donald uh, Davies talked about this. Once the stand is mature, species and site dependent, let's call that four to eight years, you get to harvest the bamboo comb annually. The rhizome pushes it up again. And when it grows, the replacement is fully grown in the next annual growing season, four, five, six, seven months. That's the trick. That's the magic. You get to selectively harvest bamboo at the rate of maybe 20 to 25%. And that means you will be literally farming carbon. And then, as David has said, you'll be applying it, hopefully, in the built environment for durable storage. So with this chart, you can see how much faster bamboo can be to capture and produce structural products that can be stored into buildings compared to wood. So this is not just growth. This is the full advantage, showing that when you harvest, and you durably store the carbon that you farmed in the, in the partial harvesting of bamboo, 
how much the advantage is for timber bamboo compared to wood. This is a 20 year chart. We don't have longer than 20 years. It's time for us to move. Now let's turn to the mechanical properties. Here, I wanna compare on the horizontal axis, uh, stiffness or MOE, the modulus of elasticity, and on the vertical axis, uh, MOR, um, or the, the, the ultimate failure uh, under load. And wood, four wood species, we're showing here on the bottom left that we've tested. They're all wood species that are regularly used in framing. And above it is one species of bamboo. It's a temperate bamboo um, uh, out of Asia. And that particular bamboo is stronger, it, but it is not stiffer. And that bamboo is the one that's primarily used in flooring. Now look at the top right, you will see we have three different bamboo species. Two of those come from Asia. One of them comes from South, uh, from South America. And for every stiffness, the bamboo is stronger or said differently for every uh, strength level, the bamboo is stiffer. And these are not the strongest bamboos or the stiffest bamboos that are available. Now let's look at, at variation across species, not between wood and bamboo. And in the first example, we're showing density versus uh, stiffness. And if you're colorblind, you can kind of see a, a, a trend um, that you can conclude maybe for every density, uh, the MOE goes up. But if you actually look at the colors, you can see, take the dark blue in the middle, you can see that, that for a specific species, the density uh, it gets tight around, uh, for a single species gets tight. But the modulus of elasticity, the, the, the bending strength doesn't, the bendability, it, it, it's widespread. And to me, that's a really interesting observation. I'm not trying to make a strong statistical conclusion at this minute, but I point out the significance that density doesn't explain everything. Now I wanna look at uh, density versus uh, uh, MOR versus ultimate strength. And you don't quite see the same trend across species that you thought. You don't quite. And then if you compare MOE versus, M, uh, versus MOR, what's interesting to me isn't the almost visual uh, uh, trend that there seems to be some correlation, but it's where the origin is. The origin is at zero, zero on this chart. So if you take the leftmost point and go to the rightmost point, you have a four times difference, a four times difference in the, in the, um, in the um, stiffness. And if you take the vertical, you have a five times difference. So that says that species is really, can be really specific, but it's not just species. It's growing location, it's the age of the comb, it's the height on the comb, it's the radial cross section of the comb, it's whether you're testing node and internode and whether it's been treated. As an example, these three gray dots here, they are the same as these orange dots here, just, the exact same bamboo, just with a different treatment. So with bamboo, we can be inspired by the beauty of organic design that bamboo contributes to us and that we sort of all uh, associate with bamboo. But we don't think at Bamco, we don't think that's, that's the game. The game is the utility underneath this. We are not trying to pursue the beautiful organic opportunity, the organic design opportunities. This is what we're driving for. We think the built world has a huge challenge ahead of us, and we need the utility of bamboo to address it. Between now and 2100, there will be 6.3 billion new people to house on the planet. They will principally be in the global south. And as that building demand occurs, there will be a rise also in the quality of the buildings. So now we will have a double challenge. We will need to build more 
and we'll need to build better. And then here's where the kicker is. In the global south, the primary building material are cementitious, high thermal mass materials. Global warming is making everything warmer. And uh, I'm sure our friends in India tonight that are joining us uh, get this firsthand from the horrific heat wave they've had in the last week alone. And with thermal mass, if we continue to build with a high carbon footprint, uh, cementitious materials in the global south, we will have to use an extraordinary amount of energy to overcome the thermal mass of the buildings. And we think therefore that we have an opportunity to use bamboo to change all of that. Here's what we do at BAMCOR today. Today, we take timber bamboo, we engineer it into a structural veneer, combine it with a, uh, a fiber oriented uh, special piece of plywood, press them into a durable, hard, super strong panel, and then prefabricate that panel for either single family or multifamily uh, buildings up to the five story level uh, in, in the US. What it looks like is this. We have an opportunity to change the method because the material has changed. On the right is the prime wall that we have in the marketplace in the US. On the left is a conventional wall, uh, which would be built in uh, United States, North America, uh, Canada, uh, Northern Europe, some parts of South Korea, Japan, um, uh, Australia, and New Zealand are building in the uh, wood frame balloon system. When we take the super strength of timber bamboo and combine it with wood, that's part of the fiber optimization that Don Davies was talking about, we're able to eliminate the studs, the headers, the posts, the lintels from the cavity. And when we remove them from the cavity, we change the thermal envelope, essentially from an oven to a thermos. The second change that we can do is because we know we're going to prefabricate, we need to bring together modern cloud-based design so that we can cut the panels once fully prefabricated to millimeter accuracy in a nearby fabrication facility. We're very fortunate that Auto, we count Autodesk as a partner uh, and an investor and have helped us in the development of this cloud-based sharing system which does not require software, it only requires a browser. Out of, out of sharing the, uh, a 3D model that we develop of each building with the design team for the customer, we're able to invite them in the browser to mark the building, mark the panels, mark the vertical elevations any way they want. And then we'll capture that and we will print it on the panel. So here, we're just marking the ID of the panel. You can see that there are blue dots that have already been printed on. We print in six, in six different colors. And when we're done, the entire plan job set, the hard copies of the plans that get lost, get dirty, get rained on, and are hard to interpret, have been turned into analog instructions on the wall. And here, we are cutting to millimeter accuracy the details that we extracted from the plan set. So that's method change two. And then method change three, when we deliver to the job site, because we built a 3D model, we have a chance to change the way the installation happens. And so what we do is we can provide an animation so that no construction literacy is required anymore. It's a paint by numbers, put them up by numbers, and you have an animation if you need it to make it simple. Literally five students did a 1200 square foot duplex. They'd never touched um, a nail gun in their life. They did it in five hours. So we can get three method changes that help accelerate 
and lower the carbon cost and labor and time to build when we, um, uh, when, when we change the material and change the method. Now, relative to climate change, we've had four LCAs done on our product set. One of them showed that if the framing system changes from standard stick built uh, balloon stud based framing, an average house in North America could save 223 metric tons per year, uh, excuse me, per, per service life. And at scale, at scale, adopting just the prime wall uh, technology, the, the thermos, if you will, envelope, about 10 gigatons of uh, greenhouse gases can be reduced from the global north. That doesn't include the global south. So everything that we just talked about was for the low rise market up to five stories. But again, as Don Davies pointed out, when you, when you focus on it as a fiber and you bring it into a hybrid relationship so that each fiber that's being used is optimized for cost and performance, you can go into the mid rise and high rise markets and you can go into the, uh, the concrete tilt up market. So here's an LCA um, that did a comparison of a, um, of just using the kind of the way Don laid it out, just using a mass timber bamboo panel that we've designed, prototype built, and had third party tested. And it will result in a reduction in the carbon footprint of the structural envelope by 50% compared to concrete and steel, and by 20% better than the best CLT, the best of breed CLT in the marketplace today. Don also made the point about high rises. It's the mass is in the floors and just changing out from the crenellated steel sub, sub deck underneath the concrete topper to a form of a mass timber bamboo panel to provide the, the, under, the underlayment for the concrete, you can reduce again, the embodied carbon of the whole building, of the whole building structure by as much as 20% compared to the best of breed CLT. It's because you're fiber optimizing. This is not 100% bamboo. This is a combination of bamboo and, and wood with, with the concrete on top of it, and still it outperforms. So that's where I'd like to stop. We've talked about a change in material that can lead to changes in methods that can allow us to lower the carbon cost and labor and time to build. And I wanna end with this quiz, which you're welcome to take a screenshot of if you like. A few questions that I think we get confused about, about bamboo and about climate change. Take a screenshot. You're welcome to uh, send me an email. We'll send you what we believe the, the, the sound answers are. And if you have thoughts or ideas on what we're doing or what we should be doing or what we could be doing, we'd be happy to hear from you uh, in that vein as well. That's where I'd like to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Hal. Excellent presentation. Uh, one of the things that I thought we could um, look at is uh, your World Bamboo Foundation work and, uh, and, and, it's, and how it's been doing in terms of addressing rural poverty and the impact uh, you, know, it eventually, you eventually expect it to have. So it's in, it's, it, we just finished our first year and Suzanne has been a uh, partner and, and leader in most of it. And I'm uh, unbelievably indebted to her for that. And in the first year, our primary, um, our primary activity was to um, select out of 150 candidates, eight fellows, um, not meaning to gender that, eight, eight, uh, eight, eight scholars to pursue a year of study on a topic that they cared about, as long as it addressed either uh, rural poverty or climate change. And we are, we're finishing that year right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think three of the projects, uh, three of the studies directly addressed um, the, the value chain aspect of, of um, uh, uh, in their research, the value chain aspect of, of timber bamboo. And uh, David Sands also made this point that you naturally are going to have an impact on rural poverty if you're going to start commercializing t uh, bamboo, no matter whether it's in a natural stand or it's in a plantation. So that's what we've gotten done so far. And we're setting our strategy for next year now. 
Okay. Um, I, I guess the uh, your prime wall. Uh, you you've done a lot on LCA, etc. Uh, embodied energy, um, as well as the storage aspect. Uh, could you just talk a little bit more on the uh, energy efficiency of this system, and perhaps uh, uh, just highlight uh, uh, its performance when it comes to durability, rain screen, and what have you. Yeah, I won't bother to put up the, the slide again, but you have to treat it just like it's a, it's a standard uh, balloon frame building. You will wrap it with weather resistant barrier. Uh, and um, uh, David made this comment, we, the bamboo that we use is always treated and we um, regularly have to do durability tests, which are advanced, which are accelerated aging tests, which is a, a boil soak vacuum, boil soak vacuum uh, on, on what comes off the production line. Um, and it should perform, and, and as far as we know, it has performed uh, in some really harsh environments like in, in, Salt Lake, uh, in Salt Lake City, there was a building that uh, one of the developers uh, couldn't get subs and he didn't finish. And our wall system was all there was with a roof and it went through an entire winter without any degradation at all. Not a bit of delam, we were thrilled. That's not what we intended uh, because it should, be, it should be treated exactly like a building and waterproofed in the same way. Well, that opens up to another question, how, which was, uh, uh, how, how, how does the structure perform? How would you expect to perform when you've gotten, uh, let's say, tsunami disasters and, and, and flooding, et cetera, and then the recovery from those kinds of things? So uh, first, structurally, um, uh, Don Davies said a couple of times, don't solve a problem you don't have to solve, right? Uh, and, and we don't have a global supply chain. Uh, and David Sands mentions this, sorry to keep going back. Uh, we don't have a global supply chain that really, uh, and, and, and Chewy said this, that really grades out bamboo yet. It doesn't, it's kind of all treated the same. And, uh, and, and, so, and so we use super strong bamboo in, ap in applications, it's not needed. And we're just about ready to go for, our, I don't know if this will be familiar to other people, but our Miami-Dade test, which is like a tsunami test, Mm -hmm. And our, our internal, our internal uh, testing of it causes us to have no, no reservations at all. So I think structurally, it'll be fine. Um, and then you take it to the extreme, though, um, and uh, work done previously by resource fiber, where the bamboo can be combined into a ballistic panel. Think of a safe house against, against hurricanes or tornadoes. Um, is, uh, it, it, I think, speaks to where bamboo can be. Very good. Uh, do you want to add, talk a little more in, with respect to durability and microbial issues in humid environments? Well, it's a lignocellulosic fiber. And if it gets wet and stays wet, it can be a host uh, substrate for, uh, for mold. Uh, it would be the, the primary issue. Um, but if it's but if it's managed the way a building is supposed to be managed, it will, uh, it will not uh, grow and sustain mold. That's the key. Uh, and so if the building is wrapped, um, it, it'll perform exactly the way uh, a balloon-based framed building would perform. And, and the panels themselves have moisture, uh, uh, moisture resistance transmission. Uh, because of the, of the thickness of the panel. Uh, and that's all factored into the building code um, uh, design values that we provide with every job. Uh, how, would you say, how would you see that compared, let's say, to wood with respect to uh, wetting, drying, uh, naturally? Shouldn't be any different. No it's a, it's a it's a lignocellulosic fiber that has the almost identical same um, constituent of lignin, uh, hemicellulose, and alpha cellulose. Mm -hmm. And if, it's, if they're treated the same, they're going to perform the same. So the ultrastructure. It's just that the orientation. Yeah. Sorry? I was going to say the ultra, uh, ultrastructure uh, at the cellular level between both. Uh, would uh, not show much difference in terms of uh, dryability after it's been impregnated with water. It, it's, just, it's, just the, it, it's just the organization of the vascular fibers. Yeah. In timber bamboo, they are, they, they I don't want to, I'm not the botanist, I can't say this, but they go from the rhizome to the peak. Yeah. And it's the only way nature can grow the plant to 100 feet uh, in one season. 
it's got to have incredible, uh, 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 incredibly direct vascular fiber, fibers, uh, and it does. And wood doesn't have that degree of, of organization at the, at the cellular level, uh, generally. Uh, I want to be yeah, careful, I want to say generally. Okay. One last question, and I guess it is uh, around where you uh, source your uh, bamboo fiber uh, for yeah. uh, your company. Well, um, it, it, uh, it, it, in the long run, it needs to be grown local, used local. Uh, we're in the US by accident of history. And so we have to import currently, uh, but Southern Florida, we're in Florida. Southern Florida is uh, already becoming uh, warm. I won't call it a hotbed yet, but it's becoming a, um, uh, planting bamboo there is a is a is an activity of high interest. Rhizome uh, has a test plot there. Um, uh, we, we're in conversations with parties in Southern Florida that could plant tens of thousands of of acres. Southern Florida today we take our bam we have we have taken bamboo or tested bamboo or contracted bamboo from I think twenty one different locations around the world. We have tested 17 species mechanically uh, from 31 locations. And our primary supplies today come from, uh, one primary supply is from uh, South America and the other one is from Asia. Great, uh, thanks Hal, uh, excellent presentation. And just from the comments we are getting in the questions and answers, uh, Many people feel the same way, that they really enjoyed this and it was very valuable information. So thanks again for your time. And I guess now we will move on to our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Jaren uh, Hemen. Uh, he's our last speaker, actually. And he's executive vice president of Lambu. Uh, over the last 10 years, Jaren has been a leader in successfully commercializing laminated engineered bamboo products for building construction applications. He will share with us some of the challenges and the lessons learned in bringing a bamboo product to market. The title of his presentation, uh, I had it in front of me and I guess I've lost it. But anyway, uh, it's, it will be on the first slide. Sorry about that. Over to you, uh, Jaron. Thank you very much, Ian. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening for those who are attending the conference uh, from where you're located. Uh, first, I want to start by saying thank you to Susan Lucas, Chu Ping Dai, and the World Bamboo Organization for inviting me to speak today on behalf of Engineered Bamboo. I'm very grateful and humbled to be sharing a conference with so many experts in the field of bamboo, as well as uh, engineering and material science. So to begin my presentation, uh, the title of my presentation is Engineered Bamboo Products used for the US design and building market. So one of the questions is, is who is Lambu? Um, Lambu is a US-based manufacturer and supplier of engineered laminated bamboo, or what we refer to as Lambu, into the architectural and design markets. Lambu's focus is to develop, or is the development of sustainable building solutions utilizing one of the most rapidly renewable resources on the planet, bamboo. With 12 plus years of direct market sales and projects, Lambu's sole focus is its continued goal of promotion and supply and the fostering of the use of engineer bamboo throughout the US and global market. A little bit of introduction to myself. Um, I hold a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering. I have 25 plus years of industrial manufacturing experiences across multiple disciplines of types of manufacturing from steel to aluminum to plastics to now engineered bamboo, which I've been very um, happy to be a part of for the last 12 years of my professional career of learning this type of material, understanding it, how to take uh, an amazing material like this and integrate it into our uh, design and building markets. I'm also uh, one of the co I'm, I piloted uh, Lambu from, from the ground floor to where it is today. Um, Lambu and myself have been responsible for first to market products such as a Florida product approved laminated bamboo rain screen system uh, that actually has been tested to Miami Dade certification. Um, we are working on completing the Miami Dade uh, certification part of it, but we have already completed the testing required and are already a Florida product proof product, as well as solid mullion curtain wall and storefront systems. 
Uh, we are one of the leading companies here in the US as well as globally in integrating this type of product into design. And then one of our big goals, of course, is to always continue and develop more products utilizing this amazing material in a variety uh, of the design and building market. So some of the challenges that Lambu has seen as far as trying to get acceptance of, of engineered bamboo into, into our market. So one of the biggest challenges, um, and I believe this is uh, you know, true for a lot of uh, spokespeople who are, who are on this uh, conference is, is awareness. It's really, there are so many design professionals out there that you know, don't even realize uh, the total abundance and ability to use bamboo and how an engineer bamboo work can be used. Most people recognize it in the flooring as well as kitchen utensils. Um, there's not many suppliers in the U.S. Uh, I could probably count them, count them on one hand as far as that provide engineered products beyond flooring. And different areas of the U.S. of what we found, they react differently to engineered bamboo. Again, when we're, when we're competing with a lot of traditional woods that have been used in uh, the U.S. for hundreds of years, it's a, it's, it's a, very, it's a challenge for us to get to where uh, we want the acceptance of this amazing product. And also is trying to educate people on how to use engineered bamboo to get past certain applications where people have used this type of product wrong and unfortunately kind of got a negative result from that. So what we want to do too is, is, is build the market. We want to make awareness. We got to create the, the knowledge that, this, that these type of amazing products are, are available to people. And, and one of the big things is implementing a new material that requires the testing to support the material to be used in these sign applications to meet international and local building codes. We always, we as a company, Lambu, are continuing to always do product testing and development for, through accelerated testing, through real world testing, where we have found the most um, information and knowledge gained just from doing the real world testing, putting it out in the elements, letting nature take its course on our materials and, and show us where we need to make our improvements. And then be, behind the awareness and the education is, is definitely the proper use, understanding the parameters of engineered bamboo and how to integrate it, these materials into a design and through projects. So there, in, in, in making sure that materials are used in the proper applications, there are applications that we've identified in three particular areas from interiors, exterior and structural applications. And one of the big things that we have found, especially for exterior type applications, is the protecting and treatment of the materials correctly per the application. We have found in some of our history, history and cases where people have used materials outside incorrectly. And as Hal mentioned just earlier, if, if it's not protected or coated properly, it is a natural product. And it could, unfortunately, adhere fungal type bacteria or mold, as I mentioned, to these materials. So we, we definitely have to maintain and treat and protect these materials as, as time allows. So I know that was kind of a short section, but what really what we've seen is in the U.S. market and how we compete is really creating the awareness and knowledge that these materials exist and can be used beyond flooring or kitchen utensils or, or other things. Um, and as some of our speakers have shown that there is there's almost limitless applications where this, where this product can be used. So the following section, I just want to kind of show some of the positives that Lambu has done and has seen within the U.S. market and from there. So since about 2010, we've actually been implementing our products uh, into the market. Uh, we took a different approach. Um, instead of working from the interior, we started from the exterior and the structural side and then kind of worked our way into offering products that offer solutions for the entire type of building process. Um, we were definitely focused on final application as well, how the products are gonna be used, um, what type of treatments need to be used with the material. Does it need to be class A fire rated? Does it need to maintain a certain structural size to hold certain loads? So a lot of the testing um, that 
is done by Lambu is actually done with partners through third party certified labs. And we use that information in, in conjunction on developing these solutions for, for the market. And then looking beyond testing. And what I mean by that is testing is always there, um, but we can't continually just sit in the testing world. We have to make awareness of this product. So Lambu as a company that sells products, we have to continue to educate the market on knowing that these products are available, how they can be used, where they can be used, and how we can help with that. So how do we promote our, our products through sustainable learning? We do it with continuing education courses. So we have continuing education courses that offer credit to design professionals that they get to, they get to learn about these type of products that Lambu has, has put together and, and offers to the market and allows them one, to gain credit, but two, to continue to learn the knowledge and where they can implement it in their designs. Um, and this is done through in-person lunch and learns as well as with everyone now with, have been through some of the, the, the COVID issues, uh, we've had to definitely up our game and from a virtual product presentation. And that's where this amazing technology like Zoom, what we're using today has really helped us. And then again, it's our continuing education of design professionals all the way to the end user. So when, when people do get our products on the job site, you know, if questions are there, they don't have to worry about sending emails to 15 people. They contact us directly. They get to work with a technical expert then and there and hopefully answer the, the questions that they have. So some of the other areas of, of what we've found is also building positive relationships with our customers as well as our suppliers. We've found that uh, over the past 10 years, we've built several relationships now that have lasted for the last 10 years of manufacturers that make the products for us to our specifications, use the treatments that we specify, the adhesives that we specify, and also any other type of of mixture or ingredient that needs to be added to the product in order to meet an application. Providing the do's and don'ts of how to use the product, where to use the product, where not to use the product, and then working with our customer through the design process, all the way from the beginning to construction itself. And then, as I say, continue to develop products to reduce overall cost of building process, and then also just being honest with our customers. Don't tell them what they, what they want to hear, tell them what they need to hear. So to provide some more examples of projects that we've been successful in on integrating our products and solutions, the next few slides are basically gonna be pictures of products that we manufacture ourselves. The great thing about Lambu is not only do we provide a material, we provide a full in-house service application to provide products to job sites so our customers don't have to worry about how is this gonna get finished? How should this be manufactured? we can provide that service to them. So from here is a kind of our Lambu exteriors products from, uh, from doors to uh, sliding uh, uh, window units and lift and slide units, interior paneling uh, products, some furniture type products such as countertops, feature walls, uh, more type of furniture products that we've manufactured and provided to the market. Um, acoustical products. This is a big one that we've really found out within the last couple of years of producing or providing a beautiful product, but also can help with reduction of sound in, in, in high reverberation areas. Um, integrating the materials into higher end applications. As you can see in this picture, we have a grill system that was integrated into a nice residential bathroom. But then we also have the capacity of creating this amazing ceiling, floating ceiling system for a high-end hotel uh, that's actually located in Minnesota. And then more type of ceiling products that uh, we can integrate. Um, besides ceiling, again, we have stair, handrail molding components. And again, as you see here, these are all products that we manufacture and supply to the job site ready to be installed. And then we've also taken uh, the part and from the structural standpoint, um, using it in the actual applications, curved glue lamb beams, post, post applications, trellis applications. We were actually very fortunate to work with a uh, very renowned uh, car manufacturer, BMW, and helped co-design a solar charging station that is 
made of solid lambu. Other applications, curved fascia pieces to go along with our beams, um, design elements, uh, canopies with structural members in them. And then one of the big ones that we are really proud of also um, is our curtain wall and window wall storefront type systems. Uh, this, these, this is actually a picture of a, uh, one of our largest uh, projects to date up in Saugus, Massachusetts for a middle school, high school project um, where there was, there was certain areas of the curtain wall that spanned 28 feet with vertical members. Uh, so we've been, we were able to work with our third party engineering companies to help design and provide these products ready for installation. And we work directly with the installer um, on questions or any type of application uh, questions that may arise and they get to create beautiful projects like this. This is a, another one from a storefront standpoint. Uh, picture up on the left is actually located in Australia and uh, the bottom right corner one is actually located in Wisconsin. So as you can see, we've integrated our systems globally and are continuing to try to grow that awareness. And beyond structural and exterior elements, we try to, we try to give our customers the availability to be free thinking and just come up with something that can challenge us to, uh, to create uh, a material for their project. Um, as you can see on the bottom left-hand corner here, these are actually Lambu gears that were designed to work with each other uh, for a sustainable project located in Chicago, Illinois. And what's great, again, these, uh, these are actually mounted and they actually work in conjunction with each other, um, but it's all solid Lambu uh, material. These are some other features uh, that we've done uh, with the material. So. And I'm almost to the end of my slide. I know it was probably pretty quick, um, but I want the pictures to speak for themselves to just show that, yes, these materials can be used as structural beams, can they be used to listen doors? Absolutely. Curtain walls, absolutely. And we are the company that are pioneer and leading a lot of the charge on this. Here's my contact information. Please feel free to email me, call me, visit our website. Our website is the encyclopedia of our company. Um, you could pretty much find anything and everything you need to know about Lambu. If there's not, shoot me an email. I'm more than willing, or give me a phone call. I'm more than willing to talk to you directly. So I want to say thank you very much for allowing me to present, and I'll be open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, the, um, I guess... Uh, we're starting to get questions in, but uh, perhaps I could start off. Uh, you, you, you've, you've indicated quite a lot of uh, work that you're doing in terms of trying to support the message out and develop the market, uh, such, uh, such things uh, as uh, uh, public uh, awareness, education, work on codes and what have you. I, I'm just wondering, on the wood side, they've got a pretty sophisticated system uh, uh, of working with respect to the American Wood Council, the Canadian Wood Council, uh, government support, et cetera. Uh, how do you see that space and how can we move it to the next level so that we're, we're, we're on an equal footing, at least with uh, some of the competing materials? Yeah, and that's a, that's a great question. Um, so a lot of the focus that we've had in regards to testing, we've used a lot of the ASTM standards uh, that are used under the engineer wood division. I believe it's the D5456. And, and back in 2008, um, a colleague and I were actually working on trying to get um, LVB, laminated veneer bamboo, uh, included into the actual testing standard for, uh, for bamboo. And we were actually successful in doing that. Now, there's still more work that has to be done on, do, on getting that finalized and completed. Um, and, and, and we continue to try to push the front on doing that. Uh, but, at, but what we've seen in the market, again, trying to create awareness and, and, and push the knowledge that things beyond flooring and, and other type products exist, you know, that, that's, that's been our biggest challenge is trying to do that. And, and we, are, we have been taking measures over the last few years to do better on doing that. And I think a lot of the panelists that are 
that are speaking today, I, I believe they share the same, the, the same endeavor. It's just, we have to get these design professionals and engineers and, and, and architects um, the know-how that these products exist and the benefits that they provide as a lot of the panelists have uh, has presented. Well, that's excellent. Uh, yeah, uh, well, again, uh, we, we have to move on. Uh, we uh, Pablo has just joined us uh, so that we'll be in a position to uh, bring him on. Uh, and so, uh, Jared, I want to really thank you uh, for an excellent presentation, and uh, uh, we'll make sure that the follow some of the follow-up questions that we've had are covered in the uh, panel session. So thanks again. Now, Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Pablo uh, van der Lutte. Uh, He's responsible for sustainability at uh, Moso uh, Bamboo Products and is a senior lecturer on bio-based building materials and systems at the Technical University at Delft in the Netherlands. The title of his presentation is The Driving Role of Architects in Bamboo Product Innovation. Uh, Pablo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. Uh, sorry, something got messed up in the whole timing, I suppose. I thought I had a one hour extra, so I didn't be able, wasn't able to do a check. So let's hope that the sh uh, screen sharing works. So you see my uh, screen, Big? Looks like it's just coming up now. And there it is, perfect. Great, thank God technology works. I hope the, the, the kids should stay uh, quiet at the back. Um, so I have to dive in. I expect I had one hour uh, extra, but so, sorry, something got messed up in the time difference. Um, so anyway, really happy to be able to uh, share uh, the, the Mozo experience. I have various roles still connected to Delft University, but also still work uh, at Mozo International. Um, I will show, show you in the coming uh, 20 minutes how, uh, in, uh, how architects can be a very important driver in uh, developing uh, product innovations. Um, so I started with Bamboo, uh, very quick background. I started with Bamboo 20 years ago when I did my Master's of Architecture and did a, a, a housing project analysis at Fun, Fun Bamboo in Costa Rica. Intrigued by the well, subject, I continued doing my PhD on this uh, topic as well, focusing more on, on engineered bamboo, uh, understanding that in Western markets, it's just very difficult to use the bamboo stem still. Um, so I joined uh, Mozo as head of sustainability and innovation about 10 years ago, um, when I also finished my uh, PhD. And since then have been active both in the bamboo industry also uh, writing the book, maybe you know this, Booming Bamboo. But the last five years, I've seen the coalition that's possible between engineered bamboo and moss timber. So this is a book I wrote two, one, two years ago, Tomorrow's Timber. And I think there should be uh, timber, moss timber and uh, engineered bamboo should be uh, friends and not foes. I think we're both very interesting bio-based uh, materials. And this is important because we have two major uh, environmental problems. And at the working in the building industry, we really have an impact to make. Well, first, resource uh, scarcity, taking into account that 44% of extracted materials are used in the built environment. And uh, then looking at the available reserves, especially of metals, uh, will come to an end by uh, the end of the century. Same uh, applies for oil-based uh, plastics, which most plastics are and still tropical hardwood can also sometimes be a problem. So that's problem one. So we need renewable resource. And we all know the giant bamboo can do a phenomenal uh, job uh, in the air. It has, has in that sense also been a, a benefit compared to uh, timber species. Um, then the second environmental problem has to do with climate uh, change, obviously. Uh, and also here, the built environment has a huge impact. 39% of the greenhouse gas emissions are related to the building industry. Of this 39%, Two thirds is related to operational energy use and one third to the embodied carbon. So the CO2 emissions during the manufacturing of our building materials. And half of that is related to the concrete production and the other half is related to uh, production of metals and plastics. You don't see timber or bamboo here. And uh, that makes sense because if you look at the CO2 pyramid, and by the way, this is a very cool uh, interactive website that you can go to, a Danish web website. If you Google material pyramid, you'll come here and you see that on top of the pyramid, most CO2 emissions per cubic meter, you see aluminium, 
and you see uh, steel, you see concrete, and at the bottom, all kinds of bio-based materials. So this applies to timber, it applies to engineered uh, bamboo. So these kind of larger buildings, there's a mass timber building in the Netherlands, and I love this example, it's Hotel Jakarta in Amsterdam, and it is made out of uh, 200 uh, mass timber units, CLT, uh, constructed very quickly, and then with glue lamp overhangs, but all the finishing here is, uh, is with bamboo. So the bamboo flooring, uh, walls and ceiling. So this is a very nice coalition between uh, timber and uh, engineered uh, bamboo. So I, 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 when I, we have clients for Mozo, I always take them here because here you see the union uh, coming well. And also here it was very important to take uh, the architect along in the story because he made a lot of specific requests which we could only cover with bamboo. Um, I think you all know the photosynthesis formula. This applies to timber. It also, of course, applies to bamboo. Alleen, only for bamboo, it goes a little better because it grows quicker and therefore absorbs more CO2 per um, cubic meter. So uh, based on the latest uh, environmental product declarations done for uh, Mozo, we also included the carbon stored. Uh, one cubic meter of timber stores about one ton of CO2. Bamboo, as it's densified, especially the highly densified bamboo or the strand woven bamboo, stores even more uh, carbon. So if you take that into account, then you see the construction stored carbon, including the, the CO2 emissions during production, that also bamboo is at the bottom of the pyramid. So this is a good thing. Um, and this is very important for architects, sustainability, but also technical performance, design possibilities. So that's why we focus a lot on, the con, um, on CPDs continuous pro, uh, professional development for architects. And we give sessions in-house. And this is um, uh, very important because these are the aspects that you show here in this mood board that we did a survey on their uh, architects. And this is what they find important. So sustainability is important. But one of the things they also very much like about engineered bamboo is technical properties and the possibilities. And you can capture those if you take along the architect right in the beginning of uh, the story. So be a co-partner, a co-partner, a co-developer. And this is how uh, many of our, well, bigger projects came to uh, fruition. So uh, of course you probably all know uh, Madrid's uh, airports uh, and I'm still amazed how many people think it's timber. This is um, an eight layer uh, lamella of uh, uh, veneered uh, bamboo and each layer was uh, individually fire impregnated and very flexible. And this could, could only be developed uh, with, uh, our, uh, with, with engineered bamboo, uh, also meeting the fire classes. And we could also only do this by, from the beginning, be in contact with the architect uh, team. And we see more larger architectural firms, really famous brands, uh, adopting uh, engineered bamboo. Zaha Hadid, one of the most famous architectural agencies in this lead uh, gold platified um, uh, mall in, in Milan and doing very cool CNC uh, cutting of the highly densified uh, bamboo product. Uh, but also, as I mentioned, Hotel Jakarta, the uh, architect demanded a very clear selection in color of a material. And it was very difficult to get this in timber. And I want, he wanted everything more or less the same color. So with a very tough color selection also in China in the factory we were able to deliver this uh, project and that's because we thought along with the architect he in the end specified um, the, the, the Mozo engineered uh, bamboo product. Uh, the restaurant is like this as well even these cuttings uh, for this um, bar um, uh, head uh, also were done in bamboo. And I want to take you with two examples of uh, explaining a little bit further with uh, how the architect has also helped in a co-development uh, reach a certain product, which is specifically developed for a certain project that an uh, architect wanted. So that's the, for example, the Mozo Ultra Density Board. This is, um, looks like Scrimber, but it has an extra, uh, um, uh, um, how do you say it? A densified board with extra many uh, crevices in, in, in the strip to make an extra adhesion uh, in, the, in, the, in the compression. Um, and why did we do it? Because this architect, one of the biggest architectural firms in France, uh, Arab, right from the beginning, our account manager uh, thought along together with our R&D team, what were the requirements for this specific 
project. And this is not the easiest project, it's Gare du Nord. I think this is the most intensively um, uh, used train station maybe in Europe. 200 million passings uh, a year, a lot of footfall, uh, spillings over it. So you want to have a quite a durable product which has extremely high density. And uh, the architect also explained if we want to use this and to, uh, 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 substitute tropical hardwoods, you need to have a special uh, approval, an ATEX approval. So together we worked on this and could develop this extremely densified uh, board, which uh, was put on top of a thermally modified uh, beam system and also explaining to the architect that you really want this because of the higher wear resistance, because of the higher uh, densification. Uh, so this is the final result. And if you come th uh, through uh, Gare du Nord, now you will always watch your footing because it, it's not hardwood, it is the, uh, the ultra density uh, board and it performs really very well on the, uh, on the floor level, but also for the uh, staircases. So this is another very interesting co-development where the architect played a key role in the joint development and understanding the needs to make this project happen. Uh, another and uh, very exciting example, I know we're going to talk in this conference about structural or semi-structural uh, applications uh, of timber. And to me, it's not, well, uh, if we look at the European market, we have a lot of uh, softwood and a lot of moss timber, a lot of blue lamb from Germany, from Scandinavia. So for me, it is okay there to use blue lamb where, and, and use uh, pine. But in some uh, areas, it makes sense to use the local source or you want to use bamboo maybe because it performs better and you can make more slender glue lamb profiles. Still, as we all know, we need a lot, do a lot of testing to get this, uh, um, uh, to reach this uh, status. Um, per project, you have to spend maybe hundreds or hun more, uh, uh, near a million uh, dollar to reach this uh, certification. And uh, we see a lot of very interesting development, which we did together with an architect, actually um, um, inspired by the architect. And that has, it has to do with this, uh, our Infinity product is the, the product name. And what is this? this is, these are very long beams that have hook joints. Um, uh, on strip level, on various level uh, places across the beam. So it's not a finger joint, uh, which was a weak spot in a beam. No, this 12, up to 12 meter long beam is ever, as strong uh, in each place of the, of the beam. Uh, this makes it very interesting also for semi-structural use. And this is also what we find out working with the architect who did our first semi-structural project on this. It was a solar carport for BMW. Uh, Archi brand, and together with them, we developed, looked at other uh, opportunities for this Infinity uh, indoor product. And we came to curtain walls, window frames, or pergolas for outside use. And then the architect said, okay, I'm convinced. And we tested it. I'll go show you the results in a second. He said, we're going to apply it. We're going to use it. So when you have a launching, launching project, as Mozo, we are also able to do testing certification costs and show that it is possible. So that's what we did for this project. And we did a, 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 a very extensive testing with the University of Cambridge and Graz in Austria, very renowned uh, uh, universities. Uh, Michael Ramach, I'm sorry, I just missed your presentation, but uh, you're also involved with this. And through this, we got the uh, DIBT. So that's a very strict German approval to use this beam for structural applications also for non-structural application, but we're more interested in this new area, the structural applications. And the results show that uh, in terms of compression and tension at uh, the lighter green uh, bar and bending, bamboo performs better than spruce or glue laminated uh, beams that are typically uh, used. Interesting enough, the E-model modulus is lower. We know this because bamboo bends further without breaking. Um, and for applications where you need a lot of stiffness, this is not handy. For applications where you need some flexibility, such as curtain walls, it is actually a very interesting. And uh, this is the curtain walls is therefore a very interesting application for this uh, semi-structural uh, uh, infinity bamboo product. Uh, so the architect decided, uh, saw the results and said, okay, we're going to apply this. Uh, we want to use this for this project in Germany. And uh, well, this is the final result. You see uh, here the finger joints, and you see also that's quite a slender profile. So with timber, this would have been a little bit more difficult, but showing the testing results and DIBT 
density uh, approval uh, showed that we can use it as a curtain wall, as a semi-structural uh, application uh, with a very nice look. The aluminum on the outside, the very warm, slender profiles of the uh, beams, the bamboo beams at the inside. And also the architect really loved it that we did this co-development. So he became a, a, a product champion uh, for us. Uh, with, te with uh, testimonials about uh, bamboo and um, about this project. So taking the architect along is very important and it will be a brand ambassador for you. Uh, so this is another uh, private project. And now we see more and more projects with this infinity product, uh, product coming up. The latest one is in, uh, in France, the Orange, uh, the big telecom company Orange has done its whole development um, of its, uh, its uh, head office with this uh, uh, curtain wall, but also then in the meantime, using it for the flooring and for the wall paneling. And uh, so they really like that you have with bamboo, you have one size fits all with the same kind of color selection and the same grain. And even because the architect got so convinced, uh, they also used it on the uh, top floor for the uh, decking, uh, the thermally modified decking, the bamboo extreme products on, for the roof terrace. This is also what we see with other architects. This architect made his own house out of the um, uh, Bamboo Extreme, so the thermally modified uh, uh, outdoor product. So we developed special uh, cladding lads for this uh, architect and also using it for the roof. So by thinking along with the architect and its needs, this architect now has become a big uh, champion for us. Also in other projects, this is his own house, but uh, he does many other uh, residential buildings. Um, and even now in the central business district of Paris, we see bamboo popping up with very nice uh, groovings and millings and even shutters uh, using the thermally modified bamboo. So the architect becomes our material and innovation champion. And that is why it's so important that from the start, you take the architect along. To finish off, I want to show you five big developments. What I expect will be crucial in the coming uh, 25 years in the uh, bamboo uh, industry. Uh, to, uh, if, to, to make it a success. Um, that is, uh, and there may well be more, but these are five very interesting developments. I think we will see more structural applications of, uh, of, of bamboo. First, semi-structural and also more outdoor uh, applications eh, like the pergolas and maybe uh, even semi-structural applications at the facade. Uh, an interesting additional uh, field will be structural applications for the civil engineering uh, sector. For example, the highly densified beams we now use, we never thought it would be possible, but we use it for crane mats uh, and load spreaders for really heavy traffic um, infra uh, applications. So this here we are directly replacing tropical hardwood in the Netherlands. Uh, I also see a lot of uh, potential for other uh, giant bamboo species besides uh, mozo that will be used. I know there are various uh, companies, of course, that are also presenting today that are experimenting with uh, guadua. I really hope to see uh, asper uh, engineered uh, bamboo from Indonesia. And the, 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 cr the crucial part of this will be, of course, to not only use the bottom of the bamboo stem, but to add value to the whole bamboo stem, because only then you can have a bamboo industry which is feasible. Uh, I also hope to see that in maybe five to 10 years, we see a bamboo industry developing in Europe. Um, I like the ambition of the company Bamboo Logic in the south of Europe, uh, planting now about 100, 200 hectares of uh, bamboo in Portugal, also plants for Italy and France. Well, climate change has its problems, but maybe it can also have some benefits making um, uh, lands suitable for reforestation with bamboo and potentially an engineered bamboo industry closer at, from home than the subtropical or tropical areas where we now source our bamboo from. And finally, I really believe that, uh, as I said in the beginning, bamboo and timber should work together. So I think there can be very interesting hybrid um, tim timber bamboo element, building elements like cassette flooring, like glue lamb, like eye joists, in which the strength of bamboo is combined with the strength of timber. Friends instead of foes. And in that sense, we are working on various developments, including uh, a CLT uh, panel, together with a large CLT manufacturer in, uh, in Europe uh, with the top layer in bamboo. And I'm sure a lot more will follow. So, so thank you for uh, uh, waiting for my presentation. Uh, please connect. I like to post a lot uh, on internet, on, on LinkedIn. 
about the engineered bamboo, about the latest, latest moss timber developments, about the developments with Mozo. So this is really exciting, and I encourage you to uh, well to link on through LinkedIn. And uh, well, I uh, I hope I can answer some questions uh, later in the panel. I hope I kept within time, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, that was excellent, uh, and a really neat way to sort of. Uh, end our, 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 our presentations today. Uh, one thing that really came out and struck me quite forcibly is the approach that you are using in dealing directly with architects, et cetera, and working with the structural engineers, et cetera, forming that tight, tight relationship, which really be, then becomes champions to start profitizing the value by demonstration. And uh, this is something I think the wood products industry only came to realize very late in life when CLT came along. Uh, they moved from focusing only on the forest and being producers uh, of lumber to actually moving up or uh, down the chain, I should say, to, uh, to the architects and engineers. So you capitalizing on that is to me is a stroke of genius. Uh, just on that note though, uh, how do you, how, how do you see the appetite growing with respect to architects and engineers in the EU? And uh, where do you see that moving to in the next five years, let's say? Yes, I see a lot of momentum in the Netherlands uh, for a mass timber building because of the climate benefits and circularity benefits. Uh, potentially, you can uh, design a lot more for dismountability and prefabrication. And in the, in the slipstream of this development, uh, moving to a bio-based economy is often uh, referred to. It's also adopted in uh, a lot of EU guidelines. Um, it's called the European Bauhaus, really focusing on bio-based materials. And upfront, a pole position is mass timber, but in the slipstream, a lot of the finishing uh, is understood that bamboo is intrinsically a very well-fitting material. So I see the mass timber market growing explosively, and that really has to do with a lot of architects becoming champions. So like what Michael Green has done in uh, North America, we have a couple of star architects doing the same, Shiguru Ban, uh, for example, or uh, Andrew Wall, Wall Tisselton architects, they're becoming champions. And this has created so much momentum. And uh, we see a lot of interest uh, also uh, for, for engineered bamboo, for the finishing mainly, and also as an exterior, so the interior can be done, the, 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 the core and shell can be done in mass timber maybe potentially a little bit in bamboo, but I really believe in a combination of the finishing of the interior with the bamboo and also the skin with bamboo. As we saw, we can engineer it so um, tightly and so precisely that this uh, is something which many architects uh, appreciate. And in the, in the past, we saw with a lot of wood magazines, see, oh, no, we don't want to feature a bamboo product. And now it's changing, this mood is changing. And we see now in the Dutch wood magazine, also a whole special about bam uh, bamboo. So the coming five years, I think a great momentum for engineered bamboo as well in, uh, in Europe. Well, that's, that's great. Uh, would you talk a little bit about your experiences in the European community with respect to the comparison between, let's say, engineered wood products, cross laminate timber and other, other things, as well as engineered bamboo with respect to price point, attributes and performance? Um, so for real structural use, uh, you need a uh, uh, European technical approval, uh, ETA, um, and this is still uh, out of the league for engineered bamboo. This just costs too money. Then we um, too much mo much money. So we, then we really need a united bamboo industry with a lot of capacity. So if we look uh, comparing it with uh, for finishing, for outdoor finishing and interior finishing. The price point is uh, actually uh, getting more competitive because of the scarcity of hardwood that we experience in Europe and also for oak. Also the war, for example, in um, Russia with Ukraine, where, which we, where we source a lot of oak from, uh, this is helping in the advantage of uh, engineered bamboo. Having said that, I'm also aware that we also have our restrictions with the rising uh, sea container costs from uh, China. So, it's, it's, it, uh, uh, but we see the demand has doubled or tripled since Corona and since the, the Russian crisis. So uh, price from price point perspective, 
uh, especially the outdoor product because of the high durability and the guarantee that you can give its durability class one with at least 25 years really helps us outperform many hardwood products and sometimes be competitive or at even a lower price as a certified hardwood. I don't know if this exactly answers your question, but... Um, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's great. Well, thank you, Pablo, for an excellent presentation. And now we're at the stage where we're going to move into the panel discussion. So I would ask uh, the organization to have all our panelists pulled in together and uh, we, can, we can go from there and, and take on questions from the audience. David, are you getting that? Or, oh, yes, everybody is here. Okay. Uh, Kuwait is here also. Uh, uh, excellent. Okay. Uh, well, let's let let's start looking at some of this. Uh, so, some of the things that came out by one speaker, I think other speakers would probably want to comment on that. So we should try to pull out some of those questions and go around the table and ask for additional comments. Uh, uh, let, uh, Let's go back to the uh, performance deficiencies and things that we have to improve on, because that'll set the stage for tomorrow's discussion on research and what have you. But does bamboo have inherent uh, performance deficiencies compared to other construction materials? We talked a lot about durability as one, fire as another. And what steps can we take to mitigate these deficiencies? Anybody else out there want to take the first crack at that? Yes, go ahead, uh, Chewy. Yeah, um, I think that I'm a structural engineer by background. So, um, and I work, I must admit that my experience with bamboo has been quite limited. Um, with, with, and, um, I work with uh, researchers in China on, on a couple of projects. Uh, but copying on the, uh, or learning from the timber experience, I, I, I believe that uh, there's, there's a need uh, I think there's a lot of work on determining and looking at the mechanical properties of engineer bamboo, but I, I believe there's a lack of information on uh, connection uh, properties. I think that's going to be a limitation. I think for residential low-rise construction, that's not, a, that's not a big issue, but if you really get into the tall, large building category, uh, it's, it's, it's an area that needs to be addressed, and I don't see uh, a lot of research on in that area, especially dealing with the related to the more ad advanced or newer type of fastener like self-tapping screws, because they were really developed for timber. Yeah. And I think there's a re-engineering need to be done if they're going to be uh, used, apply in, in bamboo uh, efficiently. I think that's one area that I, I believe there's a lot of research probably need to be undertaken. Anybody else want to comment on that? I'll chime in and, and yeah. actually agree and second uh, what, what he just said. Um, the product itself is fascinating. We can engineer the panels. The trick is how do we connect them together? Um, I loved Pablo seeing the finger joint that you showed there. Um, I think there's a real issue around manufacturing limitations of how big of a piece can you create uh, and, and how do you make them longer, bigger, um, as well as then in the field, how do we do the connection? So I think connections is the trick to making it efficient and economical um, uh, in the fabrication, but also uh, what we do in the field. Um, I'll also second the comment um, that was talked earlier about the glue. If we're gonna create engineered wood products, we're, we've got to figure out how we make all these fibers work together and it totally comes down to the adhesive. Um, you know, bamboo is wonderful compared to pine in that the fibers are so much longer. And so there's a lot longer piece to glue to, but the type of fiber we're using is, or the type of glue and adhesive we use is totally the key to the sustainability conversation and the strength conversation in the material. Hmm. Good point. Uh, Hal, did you want to comment on that? Because I mean, you talked a lot about the hybrid opportunities as an entry point into, into the market. And obviously connections are gonna be an important aspect when you're, when you're mixing uh, materials. Did you wanna say a few words about that? Yeah, I wanna go back to um, uh, actually Don's, uh, his presentation. And I don't think bamboo has any limitations. 
I think it has properties. And, and those properties are much closer in lots of ways uh, to wood than an outsider might think. And the key is to, is to manufacture and engineer to the properties according to the application. And whether it's fire or, or shear, um, mold resistance, whatever it is, there's just properties that have to be managed to. And I don't think it's any different for, for bamboo, but we're just beginning to learn to manage those properties. And of course, we don't have a uniform code. Uh, we don't, we're not accepted in the code anywhere broadly, and we don't have a uniform code around the world. Good point. Uh, how about the other speakers? Would they care to comment on this question? Uh, if not, we can probably move on uh, uh, to other areas. Uh, one, one is, uh, has the impact on environment that came up and uh, the amount of adhesives we have to use. Uh, we're essentially in bamboo growing, uh, gluing large pieces of, uh, 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 small pieces of wood, I should say, as of, of bamboo as compared to gluing large pieces of wood. Uh, uh, what are, uh, how, how can we address that or mitigate this? Because this must have a tremendous effect on the embodied energy of the product. I, I'd yeah. be happy to jump in on that. Yeah. Is, uh, yeah, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but there's also at the research and commercialization level, there's already uh, work in that direction. Um, there's a group actually out of the Netherlands, a company. Um, uh, I'm good friends with the folks that started Pacific Biodiesel. And one of the byproducts of making biodiesel is glycerin. And it turns out that that is a excellent building block for a thermoset adhesive. Um, so really, you know, tying the, all the pieces together in terms of a, you know, broader climate solutions, um, you know, the waste from one industry being come, becoming the feedstock for another. Excellent. Anybody else would care to comment on that? Yeah, please. Um, yeah. I, um, I think we have to, uh, indeed, for engineer Bamboo, uh, be realistic and know that we need to uh, ad uh, adhere the fibers together. So we we'll always need a piece, uh, a bit of glue. It really depends on the product you're using. What I really like of the Infinity product, you use about two or three percent weight percentage of, of glue. With a, a highly densified product for outdoor use, you more get in the direction of 10%. So this is a key issue, but also it is not like a WPC or something. So we also have to put a little bit of nuance because everyone looks at the glue. Well, when it's only two or 3%, well, it, 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 it ends the same glue that there is used in the wood industry, meeting all VOC requirements that we've done a lot of testing in. So it is important, but we also should not over accelerate that. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, um, we have already for at, at Mozo, we already uh, looking at five to 10 years with all these. Um, and we have a lot of uh, biotech uh, companies and R&D and DSM and uh, Basef around the corner. So we've done a lot of testing with various glues. And it is really tough to get the same performance as the melamine and the PF glues and the PU glues do at the cost, which is sometimes 10 times higher and with poor, uh, more poor performance. So this is really a challenge. So on lab scale, there are some solutions. And yes, we can have a PF uh, alternative based on um, uh, bio-based uh, resources. Um, but uh, in the lab scale uh, testing that we have done, we have seen that the results are still a lot worse. So we have now another contender, which we are working on and going to uh, doing testing, but it is really difficult. And I think the demand should, if we want larger chemical companies like Henkel and Bosev and et cetera, to really make this serious, it is not only an issue for the bamboo industry, but also for the engineered timber industry, where the same applies for the glue lamp, for LVL, which also uses PF uh, for uh, CLT. So this is a really a combined demand. And I also hope that many architects and engineers start asking more and more of those questions, because I don't have, I haven't seen, and I've seen many alternatives. I haven't seen a real performing uh, alternative. And be aware, sometimes a bio-based glue can still be toxic. So it's not a golden bullet when it's bio-based. We have to be uh, bio-based phenolformaldehyde has still a certain toxicity. So there are more aspects to it than we than just than uh, uh, than you see uh, right at uh, first sight. Any other comments on that 
area. Uh, Jaron, I noticed your sound is, uh, uh, did you want to comment on that? Uh, no, I, I agree with, uh, with what Pablo is saying and what Don was saying about the, about the adhesives. You know, there's, there's so much more development that needs to be done in creating more of a, a bio-based type adhesive, but we have to use what we have now that meets the standards for the applications that we're going to put these products in and then continue to work on the development of those, of those bio-based products. Well, if we're talking about connections and that whole hybrid space, uh, and, and uh, what, what do you think has more promise, a mechanical or adhesive connections? Any takers? Um, I, I'll push that and say, uh, don't limit yourself to mechanical adhesion and now think about steel and, and, and concrete toppers and how can they be annealed to, uh, to wooden bamboo, it's, it's, not, it's no different. And I'll go further and go back to the ballistic example and say, uh, don't just think of glues as something that needs to be advanced, but uh, with enough pressure, the way some ballistic uh, products are made, um, you're gonna have the same, the, the same VOC off-gassing issues, um, but it's development across any, any way that we connect. And we're, we're especially interested to see where, um, where the bio base will go. What we know so far is that they, they're not at the same, um, it's not just a cost issue. They're not at the same performance level yet. And that's disappointing. I live in California where you can't bring anything into state without a cancer warning, right? And, and so um, any progress is going to be helpful. Uh, and by the way, we, we shouldn't think of bamboo by ourselves. As I said, we should think of, our, uh, we should think of it as a, as, a, as, a, as a wood bamboo or just a lignocellulosic. We should do it all together. Uh, I think, Pablo, you had a comment you wanted to make on that. Yeah, of course, totally agree with what Hell is saying. Just want to mention that in the, uh, the, 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 the Tomorrow's uh, Timber book, we, uh, there is a comparison actually which shows the uh, coming from Michael Romach's uh, work uh, showing that the connection efficiency of glue joints is actually uh, uh, at 80% efficiency. And for example, inclined screws or other mechanicals uh, connections are at well uh, 30 to 50 percent mm. efficiency so actually the glue I'm not 100 saying that I only want glue because in terms of circular economy you want to have clean uh, mono streams if possible uh, but on the other hand the mechanical connection uh, well the connection is better in a glue um, connection seemingly so there is in that sense also more efficiency so it is always a nuanced discussion Okay, any other, I think Don, you have a comment. Yeah, I'll just add one more other comment to that. Um, when we're talking about the actual construction of buildings, when we put it all together, whether we glue it, whether we screw it on how the pieces come together, one of the biggest challenges is um, how set it right. Everything has properties, it's, let's design and manage around the property, it's not necessarily a limitation. The, the challenge is going to come into how much labor does it take to make those connections? Like as an example, inclined screws are a great way to make a, a wood or bamboo uh, floor system composite with a concrete slab, but then now the screws you have to put in, how long it takes to put them all in, it takes too long. It takes too long, it takes too much labor that it's not economical to do it. And so I foresee issues around uh, labor reduction in how we are still able to fasten these things together to get the engineering properties we need as being a huge um, evolutionary topic. Uh, there is in, uh, any other comment? Yeah, I actually yeah, want to ahead. compliment that with Don. I, I totally agree with that because, because the properties of, of laminated engineered bamboo is it is more dense than your common woods that we use here in the, in the U.S., such as Sunyal Pine and Douglas Fir, where some of the connection joints are easier to be made with screws than it is with bamboo. But again, the great thing about with bamboo is the holding strength of it is much higher because of its, of its density, which does benefit, I think, overall from a connection and, and uh, detail standpoint when it comes to, when it comes to those connections. So, um, that's what. That's one thing that we are also trying to do when we provide products to the to the market is we're we're providing products pre-drilled or something 
ready for assembly where we try to help mitigate a little bit of that on-site on -site work that, that contributes to the overall cost. Achui. You're muted. Sorry. Just want to make a couple of points um, on the discussion here related to connection. I think for Gru connection, it's 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 stronger, but I think you have to keep in mind it's quite difficult to 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 do it well on the job site to try to make connection on the job site because of quality control and and, and, and uncertainty about the, the the final quality. That's always been a limitation of applying uh, or using uh, site applied Gru. Uh, connections such as GUI and ROTS. And in fact, that's we haven't been able to actually standardize that yet, partly because of that. The, the other comment I want to make is kind of similar to what Hao just mentioned is, uh, uh, I think we, you know, this is a starting point to some extent. And, and you know, we, we the, 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 the community shouldn't think about solving all the problem, but perhaps in a way, using his term, manage the properties and then find the niche application that's really suitable with the with the technology that we have right now for the for the product and and and, and just go with it. I think this is the same way as a as as engineer uh, engineer wood mass timber. I think uh, I think a lot of people credited the development of CLT for the tall building, but to me, I think the invention of new connection technology such as self tapping screw is really a, a bigger factor in doing it. And I, I think the current uh, type of fastener that's been, that are being used are probably suited more for wood, but I think technology can help in the long term is developing a new type of fastener that really work with the bamboo. I think it's bit a lot easier than wood. So there, there's a need to address that. And, 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 but, but, but I think that's because we're using the wrong type of fastener for, 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 for the material that they, they are not really intended for, but technology in the long term can help address a lot of these problems, and that's why I'm throwing that out as a as a as a research topic for the for the for the conference attendees to think about, uh, especially tomorrow, as Ian mentioned. Yeah, yeah, no, that's excellent. Uh, maybe we can move on to uh, some environmental issues that have come up during the discussions, and there's one here that jumped out at me because it ties in quite nicely, I think, to the circular economy and optimizing the use of all uh, waste streams, et cetera. Uh, the question is, has there been any investig investigation or application on using the outer fibers of the bamboo comb that are denser? It is my understanding that this is sanded off due to the lack of adhesion. Seems to me to be a missed opportunity. Anybody want to comment on that? 100% agree. <laughs> but, but uh, it's it's like uh, it's like pursuing the fountain of youth, right? Yeah. We have um, we've known about this as long as I've been involved in BAMCOR, and have um, uh, lusted for how do we get just to that fiber, right? The radial density difference. But the more that we've looked at it, it's really a thin difference. The the the, the densification right underneath the epidermis is pro probably, it's not two millimeters. It may be a fraction of a millimeter yeah. where it is uh, enough different to have an impact. And we've done cross-section studies where we're trying to take it from different, uh, different radial distances from the middle. Um, and, and we've also flipped both directions, right? So we'll take a, we'll take a slatted material and we will test it um, epidermis up and epidermis down. And we see the differences, but that last little, that last little bit on the outside, it's not different than the top of the comb though, right? In terms of value that, that, we're, that we might not be capturing today. Good, anybody else want to come in on that? If not, uh, we uh, can... Maybe briefly, I yeah. just want to also say that I really agree with this. The strongest part of the bamboo is at the outside. It's just not handy for the processing for your engineered yeah. bamboo. So if you think of it, and uh, this is really something for design student or a PhD of Chunping's uh, department or anything, it has so much potential, maybe for ever, extremely strong applications like windmill blades, uh, composites, 
Uh, high value added, super strong. It, it has a lot of potential. And, uh, good question. I was wondering when you'd comment, Jumping. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, um, interesting. I hear this discussion about it. Uh, I will talk uh, about the, you know, the fiber distribution and how the the, the property will, uh, uh, you know, change from inside to outside. And I'm sure uh, uh, Professor um, Ken Harris will talk about that as well tomorrow. But uh, we will talk about, you know, all the, the consideration that we have to put into when we manufacture these products, uh, the, the fiber utilization of fiber strengths itself is definitely one, but at the same time, we have to consider the, the bonding as well. So, uh, yeah. So I, I, have, I have a question though, like uh, uh, not related to the, the glue or processing, but more on the building side, has there been consideration about or more um, emphasis on the on recycling? Like the, uh, Don, you, you mentioned about the hybrid uh, option. I totally agree. I mean, every material has its own use and, and we should uh, uh, design it so that the, the strengths of the material are optim optimized. But if you combine, let's say, bamboo with uh, concrete topping, is there a consideration on like a, what the the recycling and then after uh, you know life and how how would you uh, in general how that has been considered in the in the building industry now? It's a, it's a really good question. Um, there, it's a complex answer. Um, and and the biggest thing that I would say is when we talk about circular economy, designing for deconstruction, um, how do we recycle and reuse the building components? Um, where I go with this is it starts with we need to be much more intentional with our design choices and where we use things. Um, and what I mean with that, um, if I build a building totally for disassembly in the easiest way that I can assemble it and disassemble it, I'm actually probably going to use 50% more material in the creation of the building. And, and that, that becomes the real conundrum in the life cycle consideration of building, which is lower, which is actually the better solution. But uh, where I've come down on that is we just need to be very intentional what we're doing. If I'm going to build a very large, significant structure, I might build a macro frame where my plan is for that to last hundreds and hundreds of years. And when I do that, if I'm going to build something for a couple hundred year design life, and that can very much include bio-based materials in it. I'm going to totally make them composite. I'm going to tie them all together. I'm going to use each material for what it does best. And then I'm going to protect it so that it lasts for hundreds of years. Ultimately, that's probably one of the most efficient uh, and lowest carbon solutions we can come, but it has to be a building we actually want to keep. But within that building, let's say the ground plane, I, it's going to change you know, retail choices are going to change. People, how people want to use the ground plane is going to change. Let's not try to use 100 and 200 year building solutions for something that's going to change every 25 years. And so in those applications, go ahead and let's not put concrete on it. Let's not make it composite construction. Let's make build for disassembly and recycling not just recycling of the material, but repurposing of the material, almost like a, a erector set of kit of parts, and be able to reuse that piece again and again and again in different applications. But what I have seen is it has less to do about the engineering pro properties as it does to the functional obsoles obsolescence and kind of our taste uh, for preference of what we're building. So, but I, my answer to it is just be very intentional about what we do in which application. What about uh, what came up in some of the questions was around the other applications that maybe we haven't really touched on uh, where bamboo might have a role. Uh, for instance, uh, greening up or reducing the embodied energy of concrete or steel, and that opens up the channel for biochar, uh, as well as fiber reinforcement in concrete. Uh, is there, uh, has anybody got any thoughts on that? Well, there's a fair amount of published literature on, on the use of bamboo and other natural fibers in, um, in conjunction with concrete. And um, uh, most of it's not encouraging and relative to concrete specifically, there's a, it's a tiny percent 
that you would end up mixing into the, not the clinker, but the final, the final uh, concrete. And so while we should all hope that legacy concrete can be more greened, I, I don't think it's gonna come from just throwing in some bamboo because the, it, it, too quickly you lose the property values on the concrete, but, so but it can take refer, a little bit. Maybe you refer to the, the steel reinforcement uh, Ian, in, uh, in concrete. Because there, uh, I've seen also, there's also quite some study on that, uh, also quite recently by a ETH Zurich. And previously, just using the bamboo strip as a reinforcement, that doesn't work because there's different shrink and swellage. But it seems that if the, those very densified um, uh, fiber isolated rods that can be produced, these are have quite uh, competitive results, I believe. But still, it's in the lab scale. And as Hal also mentioned, I don't think this will be the big showstopper in uh, removing carbon. I think what we should do is plant a lot more bamboo and use it as uh, and convert as much as possible of the bamboo in engineered products, because then the carbon is locked for longer in the built environment. Yeah. And indeed, if you design it for disassembly, it can be more than 100 years, 200 years. And in the meantime, the bamboo, of course, has grown back 20 times. And only the residues and that kind of stuff should be used for energy and pellets and biochar, uh, in my opinion. Yeah. That's Suzanne, very... did you... Oh, great. Suzanne, did you have a point you wanted to make? Well, just that tomorrow, in tomorrow's session, we do have... Uh, we, we do have... Uh, the speaker talking about the concrete reinforced, um, bamboo reinforced concrete. We do have that on the program tomorrow. Um, yeah, from, uh, from, from Zurich. So that should be good. And, but I do also think we, you know, I think so many of the points brought up today show that we need to do more of this, uh, continue this series uh, on bamboo and the potentials and something I did want to mention that David brought up about planting bamboo in Florida and other regions is, uh, you know, th that's a whole other series that we need to talk about because we're all talking about expanding this resource, the use of this resource, and we'll quickly run out of this resource if we all get our wish. So we need to be planting bamboo as well. Yeah, it. it almost seems just from the talks today, there's a lot of activity, a lot of promise, a lot of enthusiasm. We're almost at a tipping point. How do we move it to the next level? And I guess I would end today with one question uh, open to the floor. And that is, if you're going to look ahead to 2030, uh, where will bamboo be as a construction material in North America and beyond? And what are some of the actions we should take to really uh, accelerate this and move it forward? Now, one was mentioned, have more of these kinds of meetings, but uh, there are probably other things. And, uh, I'd, I'd ask the panel at large uh, to comment on, the, on those points. I'll, I'll offer uh, my thought about the unique thing about timber bamboo. And if it gets addressed, then I think the game changes. And it is whether or not carbon credits become available for storing the harvested structural product in a durable, in a building and, and, and the carbon credit for what it offsets in terms of the carbon intensity of what's now not in the building. Mm -hmm. This is a point that uh, INVAR last year made in their very brief policy statement. And it is the to me, it is the biggest single miss. It's hard. This is a this is a big global. You know, all of the environmental voices uh, of climate change are involved in this, and and if we can figure out in our community how to get that addressed and get a carbon credit for that, it's analogous to to direct air capture. In direct air capture, we're going to spend enormous sums at a very high cost. And they're going to get carbon credits to pump it down into the ground. Yeah. And we have bamboo air capture. Yeah. That would be Truly. my logic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, David, and and that's, that's such a big deal for me is the avoided emissions were uh, as much as the actual embodied uh, carbon in the materials. So we really need to address that. Anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah, I do. 
Yeah. Um, the, I just put it also in the chat. Construction stored carbon is what it's also called. And there's a methodology being developed, constructionstoredcarbon.org, uh, by uh, Climate Cleanup. And uh, there are really some serious uh, uh, businesses looking at uh, um, creating a methodology to uh, for bio-based buildings and the stored carbon uh, in, in, in the bamboo, in the, in the timber, to be, um, uh, be able to measure it with a kind of metric and to be able, in, in a kind of voluntary carbon credit system, to uh, actually sell those. But this is a really evolving um, uh, methodology and also difficult because who's going to claim the carbon credit? Is it going to one the, who, who puts the bamboo up and how hard, or is it the one that makes the engineered uh, bamboo product and uses it in a building? So there needs to be a very clear accounting system for that. Yeah. So the other way around is what, what could help if we have a carbon tax on building materials directly. Eh? So there are, in, in Europe, there's some a little bit vague system with the uh, ETS uh, system with CARM credits really on sector level. Uh, but if it's directly put on a building material and the true cost is put on a material, then also the, the stored carbon, but especially the, 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 the higher carbon uh, cost of CO2 intensive materials like concrete and steel will um, ri ri raise the price. So this will indeed be a very uh, important uh, aspect. Having said that, I also want to add, I think from the experience that I've seen uh, from Moss Timber, that if you have a star architect like Michael Green or what, uh, so, someone in that caliber is really interested in engineered bamboo and starts adopting it in a big project, then sometimes there can be additional budget to also do the testing all the way along. And that can sometimes be a tipping point to make this happen. Uh, so here also the uh, convincing architects, if possible with the manufacturer, can also play a role. And hopefully there's a municipality or a, a kind of commissioner who wants to pay a little bit more to do this and to be iconic, having the first mass bamboo uh, iconic bearing structure. And that, Excellent. Uh, it can Thanks be a that. Google, it can be an Apple, uh, you know? That's great. A any other hands up? I think one more focus too that um, I'm just going to kind of piggyback off with what David Sand said is, is is creating local manufacturing here in the U.S. to make these products. Um, there's there's tons of places growing bamboo right now, whether it's in Florida, parts of southern Georgia, even out in the uh, the Northwest. They're they're trying to grow bamboo, but what are they going to do with it? That's the key thing, and I think it's it's a key development for us as as uh, manufacturers and suppliers of product to the market to kind of continue to create an avenue of manufacturing this in the U.S. And I know that's a, it's a very tough comment to make, but I think that's another uh, goal that us as providers of these sustainable products need to continue to focus on doing. Great, great message. Uh, Don, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I, I'll just uh, add in to, I think, a couple of messages that have already been there. But um, we are an incredibly siloed industry of, of the built environment and how we create the built environment. And I think one of the important parts about the adoption of these engineered wood products, engineered bamboo products, is the people that are not at the table for the conversation right now. Um, you have to, we have to get the people in the timber industry to get out of a silo of just thinking about timber mm -hmm. and thinking about fibers and how can these fibers be in their commercial interest to advance the, the use of them. Um, and you need to break down some of those stigmatisms and those, um, those barriers to then get the adoption. I can guarantee you if uh, you know, some of the, the largest uh, mass timber suppliers in the, in the country right now thought that growing bamboo fibers was going to make them money, all of a sudden we can see all sorts of applications of engineered <laughs> bamboo products coming out into to what we are doing. And we need to hit that uh, business case. Why is it in someone's financial interest to go here and break down the silos? Right on. Chewy. You're muted. Hey, you guys, I'm going to need to step off. But uh, <laughs> this has been wonderful. And I'm so grateful for doing this. And I look forward to the continuation. Thanks, David. I hope oh, you, uh, thanks, Neil. Thank thanks. you, David. <laughs> I'll be brief. Uh, just answering your question, Ian, about to do, what to do with the next five years. I'm, I, I know I'm advocating for harmonization of standard 
and development, but that's a long, relatively long process typically. And, and I, I, I look back at the experience that we have for CLT in North America. It's the, to, to, to me, I think the, uh, the, 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 the changing point is actually the publication of the CLT handbook by App Innovation uh, about 10 years ago. And then that really pushed the application. I think that's probably need to be done in the short term Mm -hmm. To pull together an expert, to write the technical guy that allow engineer and designers to actually have the technical information that they have to design because it's, a, it, it, it's really for the early adopters. Uh, uh, and if you don't have such a document, it's very difficult for them to kind of get the information from all over the place and do it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the game changer for CLT to me is the publication of the CLT handbook. And I think there's a good lesson to learn from there. Yeah, that's great. Well, we're going to end this, but I would only add one last comment on the CLT booklet. Uh, there was heavy government uh, involvement <laughs> financially, and <laughs> that is a key. Anyway, uh, we're now at the end of our session. All of us are leaving, I think, uh, as an audience uh, with a much better understanding of the properties of engineered bamboo products, as well as its potential in construction. We've also learned more about the barriers to commercialization, the remaining knowledge gaps, and future research needs. Kawei and I want to again thank our speakers for the caliber of their presentations and the subsequent panel discussions. And finally, a very warm thank you to our audience for your participation. Until tomorrow, goodbye.